Welcome friends to another r slash nuclear revenge video. If you enjoy hearing these stories of nuclear revenge, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below. That said, our first story of the day is by Fred King 1313 If security asks to turn down music, just comply. So let me set the scene. I'm a security officer with Redacted Security Company. I work in a refurbished office building that's been made into a bunch of stores. I've been with this company for almost eight years, so I have a great professional relationship with the building owner, clients, and all store owners. Now, I'm generally a good guy, and I'm relaxed about the rules as long, one, as your space doesn't get out of hand, two, I am needed or called for a complaint. This particular day, I received a complaint of loud music, so I'm following procedures and walking the floors and find the source. As I get to the third floor via stairs, I can already hear the music on the floor, it's the new nail salon. I decide to go to the restroom, and on my way back, I calmly knock on the door of the salon and am greeted by store employee. The conversation went like this. I say, I'm sorry to bother you, but I've received a noise complaint. I know it's the weekend and not a lot of people are here, but I have to ask you to lower the volume, please. The store employee says, oh, okay, no problem. I didn't think it was too loud. I say, thank you for your cooperation. She then shuts the door in my face. Rude, but okay. So I continued to the other floors and didn't hear any more music, so I returned to the security desk. About 40 minutes later, store employee comes down up to the desk I'm sitting at and this is the conversation that follows. They said, you're a liar. I said, excuse me? They said, you said you got a noise complaint against me. I just went up all the floors and nobody said they complained about me. I said, I'm sorry ma'am, you misunderstood what I said. She cuts me off before I can explain. She said, don't try to backtrack now. You're a liar and I'm going to get you fired for harassing me. I called my boss and she's calling building owner. I said, I'm sorry you feel that way, but I need for you to return to your workstation as you're causing a scene in front of clients. And if not, I'll have no alternative but to walk you out of the building as the site has a zero tolerance policy for these kinds of events. She says, I'm so gonna get you fired for this and storms off to the elevators. About an hour later, I get a conference call from my boss and building owner. My boss said, morning OP. I'm on conference call with building owner and we received a wild complaint about you misbehaving on site just now. We want to get your side of things before we decide on what to do next. The building owner said, I agree as the allegations against you are really out of character and I have confidence in your performance in representing both of our interests. So I give them the rundown on everything that happened and how I handled it. The building owner said, that sounds more like you, however it's now he said she said as she claims you forced your way into her workspace and was yelling at the top of your lungs at her to turn the music down while yelling obscenities and racist remarks at her in front of her clients and how you threatened her life if you had to come back up there. She says she feels like her life's endangered as long as you're here working so close to her and her clients said that she was telling the truth. Now I was pissed. Cue my nuclear revenge. As a safety precaution a while back, I bought a body cam that is connected to my cell phone. And guess what? After the conference call was over, I remembered that, turned on my cam, and it had been recording since before I clocked into work. When I checked, I struck gold because I had a recording of all the interactions with store employee. So after reviewing my audio and video footage, mostly to get start and end points of all the interactions I had with store employee, I called my boss back. I said, hey boss, I forgot about my body cam and how I could prove what I was saying. My boss said, really? Great, send me an email and a copy of the footage for me to review. I said, okay sir, and do I have permission to contact building owner and let her know? My boss said, if you want to, I'll be calling her after reviewing the footage too. So I called building owner and told her about my body cam and how I could prove my innocence. I could literally hear her perking up at this. She responds, perfect. Send it to me ASAP, my email address is so and so, and time the notations I should look at. Fast forward two hours later, who comes wobbling out of the elevators in tears and a sobbing mess with a box with her stuff in it. With her head down doing the waddle of shame as she's being escorted out of the property by police, it's store employee. Later I find out that building owner called the salon owner and was livid that her employee was causing such a scene and had gotten her clients involved with the incident against me and how that was unacceptable. 
While building owner didn't have the power to fire employee, building owner made it clear that she was now banned from the building and all of its resources. Reminder, the salon owner that thought store employee called the shots inside the salon, her butt answered to her once she steps out of that salon. And the icing on the cake, building owner renegotiated my contract and I got a $5 raise for my outstanding service. Thank you, building owner. After having heard this story, if you were ever to work in any kind of security job, even if it was just building security, would hearing this story be enough to make you invest in a body camera for that job? Do you think just about every security guard, building security, etc. should have some kind of body camera on? Or is it kind of over the top for building security to be wearing a body cam? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And our final story of the day is by Feral Tax Evader. Buddy, you picked the wrong person to harass. The year was 2014, or maybe 2013, who gives a crap? I was a freshman in high school. On a general basis, it sucked. I mean, it was an American public high school with literally thousands of kids. It's a given that it's going to blow some major balls. One thing in particular that made it extra sucky, though, was gym class. Specifically, this one guy in gym class. This dude's name was Jack A. McGee, the A, of course, being short for butt. As the name would imply, he was a donkey. At first, it was pretty standard, high school guy in gym class, level of obnoxious jerk. You know the type. Overly loud, unreasonably aggressive during games, bossy, tossing the collective brain cell back and forth between his two equally ape-like buddies, the usual. I don't know when exactly it happened, but he developed a sort of eye for me. After the first couple of weeks or so, he started asking me bizarre questions that I now believe may have been some sort of innuendo, sitting uncomfortably close to me, resting his hand on my gym shoe, general creepy behavior. He once blocked a doorway with his body, this dude was massive, forcing me to literally squeeze my way through and crawl over him. He then tried to grab me and pin me to him once I was almost through, but I'm very good at dodging physical contact whenever possible, and dipped on him before his giant gorilla arm could catch me. I still shudder thinking about it. I cannot emphasize enough how terrible this dude smelled. But the true breaking point came during the peak cruelty of this school-mandated sadism, Jim Swim. Before anyone asks, let it be known that yes, I did try to tell someone about this. I told my gym teacher first semester, really early on, that Jack was making me incredibly uncomfortable. The gym teacher waves it off, saying he was just playing around and that it's probably because he likes you. His suggestion was basically to just put up with it and wait it out, because he was sure Jack would lose interest soon anyways. Spoiler alert, he didn't. Second semester rolls around, and the four-week period of gym swim descends upon us like the bloated carcass of a catapulted whale, crushing us beneath its wet, foul-smelling body. Forty-some-odd adolescents forced into a cold, overly chlorinated pool for fifty-plus minutes, adorned in swimsuits determined to crawl up into our butts like Ant-Man himself. It was heck on earth, basically. As I've mentioned in a previous post, I'm autistic, so the echoing sounds, reflected fluorescent lights, pungent odors, slimy floors, and assorted BS made the situation even worse for me. I wasn't officially diagnosed yet, so my complaints were written off as me being whiny, and I was told to shut up and deal with it. So I did. I think I had more meltdowns in that four-week span than I've had in the past two years combined, but whatever. On top of the sensory overload, there was Jack. I think something about being allowed to go shirtless and stare at the nearly bare butts of girls for an entire period emboldened him, because Jack promptly lost whatever semblance of restraint he'd had until then. He made frequent attempts to grab me, trying to hold me against his bare skin which was disgusting, and I spent most of the class trying to evade him. The swimsuit I was forced to wear fit a little awkwardly around my chest, which he delighted in pointing out to his buddies staring unabashedly at my chest. He managed to sneak up behind me and snap the strap of my swimsuit, even trying to pull it down off my shoulder, but I jerked away fast enough to prevent that. I'm furious at this point, 
but I'm like five foot two, maybe. Whereas he was easily over six foot five and probably 300 plus pounds. And I'm not stupid. While all of this was happening, my new gym teacher, they switched every semester, was busy trying to keep a couple of the other guys from drowning each other. She was one adult forced to watch over 40 rowdy butt kids in a swimming pool. She was a bit preoccupied. The final straw came one Wednesday afternoon. The event that finally pushed me off the edge of rationality I'd been clinging to and sent me plummeting into full-on bloodthirst. There I was, paddling around, minding my own business, when Jack and his two goons managed to corner me. I'm immediately suspicious, hackles raised, as they ask me fairly banal questions about how the pool is today and the like, cracking up the whole time. I give short, terse answers, trying to see if I could maybe slip past them. I spot an opening and bolt for it, but Jack was apparently expecting this. As I swim through the narrow gap between him and one of his friends, he stretches an arm out and actually manages to slip his hand under my suit to grab my chest. I froze for a moment, the delighted giggling of him and his friends echoing in my ears as if from a thousand miles away. The next thing I knew, I was out of the pool, being held back by the gym teacher, and Jack had a bloody nose. He was shouting angrily at me, calling me a crazy witch as his nose gushed blood into the water. There was a mass confusion among the class. I was told to change quickly and sit in the hallway. Apparently the gym teacher had heard me screech like a banshee, followed by a number of shouts, and had looked over to see me wrestle out of Jack's grip jump on his back and throw him off balance enough to smash his face into the edge of the pool wall. I remembered none of this, but I did find a few chunks of greasy brown hair clenched in my fist that I'd evidently ripped from his scalp when the teacher pulled me off. I washed my hands thoroughly. It was decided that I'd go in early to school tomorrow to have a little talk with the dean. They would have just sent me there straight away, but gym was my last class of the day and the dean had already left by then for whatever reason so it had to be postponed a little while. It was pretty heavily implied that I was going to be suspended, quite possibly even expelled for what had happened. I was furious. Not only had Jack made my life a living heck, but his horse poop was now going to be the cause of my expulsion? I wasn't about to go down without a fight, but I realized that I'd have to play this pretty smart if I wanted to weasel out of it. The next morning, I did two things. I put on mascara, and I made a superficial but rather painful incision on my right thigh, high enough so as to be covered by my shorts. Normally I hate wearing makeup because I don't like the way it feels, but I'd worn mascara before and noticed the interesting effect it had on my appearance. Specifically, I already have pretty long, pretty dark eyelashes, so adding mascara draws a lot of attention to my eyes and makes them look huge, like total Bambi eyes. Wide, innocent, naive, harmless. I sat down in front of the dean at 6.40 a.m. I didn't need to fake the fear in my expression, but I made sure to throw in something that could be interpreted as guilt too, bowing my head and twisting my face in dismay. Needless to say, the dean was pretty pissed. Do you know why you're here, young lady, he said. Yes, I said softly. And you know that what you did is very serious? Yes, I said again, making my voice tremble. Care to explain yourself then? I... I began, my voice shaking. I just wanted him to stop. Stop what? The dean prompted, his eyebrows furrowed. I just wanted him to stop touching me, I blurted. As I said this, I reached my hand under the table where he couldn't see it and dug my finger into the cut on my leg, causing me to lurch forward as if in a sob my other hand covering my face as my eyes watered from the pain. Touching you, the dean asked, his brows now on a collision course for Mars. I spent the next several minutes divulging all the crap that had happened to me that year, digging into my injury for some tears whenever necessary, and by the end of it, the dean looked horrified. He reaffirmed that no, I shouldn't have attacked Jack like that, but they'd have to investigate the matter further. I basically got off with a slap on the wrist, and after multiple testimonies from other girls, Jack got suspended for two weeks. I wasn't satisfied. They hadn't been able to expel him due to lack of hard evidence, but I was out for blood. He returned to school two weeks later, and I was ready. One of his friends had a little brother in my bio class, a fairly chill dude named Owen who I'd worked out a deal with. 
See, Jack had been very vocal about his displeasure with me to his friends, which made its way to Owen, who, for the low, low price of bailing his dumb butt out in biology, was more than willing to share that information with me. I had a direct pipeline. Anything Jack shared with his friends made its way directly to me via Owen, and as it turns out, this dude didn't keep a whole lot to himself. There was a lot of crap I was tempted to nail him for. For instance, I found out he was selling drugs, mostly Adderall and some occasional weed from his locker, and had been cheating his way through most of his classes. However, I knew how suspicious it would look for me to report something like that so soon. It'd probably just look like I had a grudge, which I did, and was trying to get even, which I was. He slipped up really, really bad about a week after his return, and that was when I struck. See, he hadn't been subtle about his displeasure with my retaliation, and spent most of gym class sending really ugly looks my way. The gym teacher kept us as far away from each other as possible, but he managed to track me down in a passing period one day, and rant at me about how I screwed him over, and that I was a lying little witch, yada yada yada, and that he'd make me regret it. Funny, stole the words right out of my mouth. I found out from Owen later that Jack had been bragging to his friends last night about the switchblade he'd stolen from one of those hunting stores downtown and promised he'd show it off to them later that day. I seized the opportunity. I took a few seconds in the bathroom mirror, scratching at the scab on my leg until my eyes were teary enough to really sell the terrified victim look, then bolted down to the dean's office, stuttering and shaking, crying out for help. The front desk lady was understandably startled by the sight of a seemingly panicked freshman girl bolting into the office and called the dean out right away. His face grew serious when he saw me. Mr. Dean, please help. He's going to kill me, I cried. Now slow down, he said. What happened? Jack, I said, resisting the urge to grin maniacally at the hardness that appeared in the dean's eyes. He he cornered me in the hall. He called me a witch and said he was going to make me regret telling on him. He... He's got a knife. He what? The dean barked. Everything moved very quickly after that. The security guards were told to search the kid's locker, while a couple other security officers were called down to get Jack out of his classroom and take him to the office. I was told by the front desk lady, who had heard the whole exchange, to hide with her in the copier room so Jack wouldn't see me. They found the stolen knife in his backpack and the drugs in his locker. That, combined with his previous charges, was enough to get him not only expelled, but arrested. I never saw him again, which is probably a good thing because I'm still mad and would probably try to kill him if given the opportunity. Personally, I don't think what OP did here was enough of a revenge against a jerk that treats people that way, all the stuff that they did, but it's definitely a darn good start. Getting them expelled and away from you and getting them locked up at least for a short term, that's a really good start to the right path for this jerk. Assistant from Heck Let me preface this by saying I'm still going through some mental issues because of what happened in this story. Background, I was born with cataracts that later became glaucoma when I turned 5. After some years, something happened that caused me to lose all vision in my left eye. This meant that I needed an assistant for the rest of my education, now that you're all informed. The story, when I was starting middle school, my parents found an assistant to help me with moving around my school. I'll call her Ella for simplicity's sake. Anyway, Ella was friendly to me and my parents, so they didn't have to worry. Ella did her job and she was very friendly with me. And then it began. One day, Ella didn't come to school. She called my dad saying that she got in an accident on the road. It was fine, she got in an accident, it wasn't her fault. I spent the first two weeks of school trying my darndest to explain why I couldn't write the work and give a convincing argument and walk around without bumping into every wall in person. On top of that, Ella became more and more hostile as the months went by. She then began telling me awful things about my appearance, my personality, and she even talked crap about my parents to other teachers who were just as scummy as her. The only reason why I didn't say anything was because she made me think that doing so would get me expelled. Me being a stupid 13 year old, I believed her. Needless to say, I was miserable. The straw that broke the camel's back was the day where she was so angry that she slapped me. I was done. The revenge? I told my dad about everything. The absences, the slander, everything. 
When I told him, he went absolutely ape crap and we went straight to the principal. After telling her everything that happened, we found out that Ella was present to write herself up as present, but she never arrived to help me. We also found out that she had faked most of her reasons for absence. After a long investigation that took two years to actually prove, we took Ella to court. I only had to testify every single detail of what she did and what she said. Long story short, we won that case and Ella went to prison for three years. After word got out of what Ella did, my family had heard that her friends and family basically disowned her. She also lost the remaining custody of her kids, which went directly to her husband, who works as a vendor that passes by my school. Ella became forgotten garbage. It's been almost a whole year since Ella went to prison, but I sometimes still hear all of the terrible things she said. Thanks to her, I'm scared to make decisions because I can't get her words out of my mind. I'm going to start school soon. Maybe I'll finally get that demon woman out of my head. Honestly, I'm surprised that even in the situation with all that they did, that they actually did end up going to prison for three years because of that stuff. I don't know if that shows like a depressing lack of trust in our legal system or really just a surprise that it would be that harsh for what they did do. What do you guys think? Are you surprised that they even went to prison for what they did? And also, do you think the three years is too harsh or just right? I'd like to know what you guys think in the comments down below. Our next story is by literally a person, Marvin's Killdozer. Sometime in the early 2000s, there was a small town in Colorado. Among the residents in Granby, there was a muffler repair shop owner named Marvin Hemeyer. He was a sort of cool guy, I don't know how to describe him. He also got along with some people. One day, some company was going to make a concrete plant right next to his shop. Marvin was against the idea, but he was alone. The construction of the plant would cut off the only entrance to the shop. Marvin tried to get some people to sign a petition, but he couldn't get enough people to sign. Marvin decided he was going to make his own entrance to the shop and bought everything he needed to do so. The city denied his request to build a new road. Eventually, the concrete plant cut off Marvin's sewage and the city fined Marvin for it. This was the last straw. Marvin started constructing a tank out of the materials he got to build a new road to his shop. One of the items was a bulldozer. He recorded himself often and eventually finished the killdozer. Despite its name, it never killed anyone. He designed it so that when the armor was lifted onto the bulldozer, it's not coming off. Marvin got into the bulldozer and lifted the armor onto it. Marvin drove the killdozer through his shop and into the concrete plant. He goes to the city and destroys buildings of those who wronged him, such as a newspaper place that lied about Marvin, the former mayor's house, and the town hall. He destroyed many more buildings. The governor of Colorado even considered destroying the killdozer with Hellfire missiles. That idea was scrapped for obvious reasons. When Marvin was destroying a shop, the radiator was leaking and the bulldozer broke down. Marvin then ended things. I forget how long ago this was, but I remember hearing about this story at some point. I don't know if I stumbled on a weird YouTube hole or something, but I definitely remember seeing like some video or footage of this killdozer rampage that was going on. Maybe it was even one of those like, world's craziest events, TV shows or something. June 4th, 2004. Calamity struck when a bulldozer piloted by blah blah blah. Really, I mean, it's an insane story. Our next story is by Don't Look Behind You 01. Refuse to pay me? Look at your garden. My cousin, who's fairly entitled, asked me to do some lawn work and dog sit for her when she was going on vacation for a friend's wedding or something along the lines of that. I agreed under the condition that I would be paid $15 per hour as she had a large garden with many flower beds. So for a week, I tend to her flowers and other yard things, such as picking weeds, watering the lawn, and picking up dog poop. She comes back and refuses to pay me. In goes revenge, so I have a house key to her house. She goes up to the mountains for a bit just because it's fun and why not? So I go into her house. I know that trash day is the next day, so I go to the dumpster and take out two or three bags of trash and dump them out all around her house. I pick up the dog poop from the backyard and put it in the bedroom under the pillows. 
Then, I take the trash still in the bin and add that to her house. Finally, I go to a local hardware store and get some weed killer that'll also kill other plants. I found out that the hard way. I spray that all over her garden. On the flower beds, the grass, and the vegetable garden for two days. When she comes back, her entire house is wrecked. The trash attracted pests. The poop in the bed ruined the pillows and mattress. Her whole garden is dead. She had to pay to get her house deep cleaned, a new mattress, replant all her vegetation, and get new grass for both yards. She paid $5,000 for something that should have cost her $210. Moral of the story, pay someone for doing work for you, please. I will say that this is definitely a nuclear reaction. To be fair, one of the things I hate doing the most is work outside in the yard around the house. So if I was OP and I got stiffed on doing all that work, I would be pretty pissed too and $210 is no like little tiny snippet. I don't think I would ruin a person's house and yards over it, but you would definitely want to get back at them. This next story is by crappy username 37 beat me up? I'll run you over. This story's not mine, neither of anyone I personally know, but it's something that happened where I live and it became news last week because of how gruesome and stupid it was. As it is public and on the news, I'll try not to give names as to not expose even more the parties and their families. This happened Sunday, April 21st, 2019. The revenge victim in the situation was an MMA fighter and the perpetrator was his Uber driver. I'll refer to them as fighter and Uber. That night, the Uber picked up the fighter and some of his friends in a planned neighborhood in the suburbs of my city. The group was supposedly drunk and were screaming and making a huge fuss inside the car, which annoyed the Uber. He asked them to stop, which they did for a while, but soon after started again. They kept annoying the Uber until he snapped. He stopped the car on top of an overpass and told them to get out of his car. This was late at night, so it had no traffic. The group started to get out, but the fighter did not like the Uber's attitude, so he started punching the Uber right before leaving. His friends take him off the driver, and the Uber speeds off. The fighter's group start walking to a nearby gas station to wait for another ride. Meanwhile, the Uber makes it back around and starts speeding back in their direction and hits the fighter in the back, running him over. From what I heard, the impact alone would not be enough to kill the fighter, but that was not it. The force of the impact launched the fighter in the direction of a truck parked nearby, and he hit his head on said truck, killing him almost instantly while the Uber sped off. The driver presented himself to the cops on April 25th. The fighter had two kids, and so did the driver. I mean, it might be a terrible time to say it in regard to this story, but cooler heads do prevail? I guess if cooler heads prevailed in this moment, somebody literally wouldn't have died. In general, this whole story is kind of just disappointing to hear about because it's like reckless agitation gone totally wrong. And our final story of the day is by Lil Tella. Don't suspend me for a stupid reason. Backstory, I'm a sophomore in high school. We have four assistant principals in our high school for freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Anyways, my school is a very left-sided school. Most of the teachers are very liberal and honestly don't let you share your own opinion if you are conservative. The story, one day I decided to post my own opinion on my Snapchat story, bad idea. I posted how it's my opinion that girls shouldn't wear makeup as I just simply don't find it attractive. Some girl started a rumor that I was talking about her and she and her friends came at my physical appearance and my nationality. I made a bad decision and called her out for cheating on her boyfriend and called her a hoe and she got really mad and deleted her stories and she made it seem like I was simply just coming at her for no reason. I was already pissed. I have tons of screenshots of what was said. However, I couldn't stop this now. I had 175 views already, and the amount of screenshots I had on that story was 86. People started making memes about me, calling me a weasel, gerbil, said my forehead was big and everything. It really hurt, but I knew I still had some friends. I go to school the next day, and I'm getting threats to get beaten up and people are spreading rumors about me. I was so distraught but I fought through it. As I was getting my lunch, a group of at least 15 girls went around me and formed a circle around me and yelled at me. The girl I was talking to at the time was on my side surprisingly and she went and yelled at all those girls. 
Many kids made rude memes about me and it really hurt. Turns out, someone told the sophomore assistant principal. She was pissed that I was just mansplaining and I didn't know anything about girls or women or why they wear makeup. Turns out, someone told the principal the wrong story and didn't show the assistant principal screenshots of everything. Crap escalated quickly and she started yelling at me and I kept saying that wasn't the full story. Turns out, someone made fake screenshots and gave it to her. I was surprised at this, and I even showed her everything that I posted, but she said I deleted it. I showed her all the things people made with the name not blurred out, and she was now surprised. She called them up and told them not to do it anymore. Then they just got let off with a warning. After they left, she told me that I was going to have to be suspended. She was a real witch, and I don't know why she suspended me for this. I was really mad that I was suspended for at least two days, all because of a Snapchat post that wasn't even that bad. Getting suspended meant a lot to me since I'm usually good, and I've had perfect attendance since first grade. This is why I was about to get into National Honor Society. Now, because I'm suspended, my chance is really low. This is where the revenge starts. Revenge. The minute I got home, my parents instantly talked to me and sided with me. They even said I could just treat it like it was a snow day, and I didn't even get punished. They were pissed too. I sat at the desk in my room on my computer, and I thought, what could I do? I looked up my assistant principal's name on Google to see if I can find any information. I find her Instagram and Facebook. She's quite young actually, like around 26 to 30. I decided to make a fake account posing as a random person so she would accept my follow request. I had to buy followers and make posts so it didn't seem too suspicious. I think I spent $30 on followers and likes. I'm not sure. I needed this to work. I soon got a notification around 5 or 6 p.m. saying she accepted my follow request. Perfect. I scrolled down to her pictures and this was before Instagram's stupid layout update so you could still see your posts. She had around like 450 posts. Could be a little less, could be a little more. I just assume around 450. I scrolled down and saw pictures of her husband and her two-year-old with her. He wasn't tagged, so he probably doesn't have an Instagram. Not a big deal. So I scrolled down more. Then I saw a picture of her, except she was in a Hooters uniform. I thought to myself that people usually work two jobs, but this picture was very odd. It was one of those pictures you could slide right and you could look at more pictures. The next picture was with a kid that looked really, really familiar. I then saw a bit of his shirt. I couldn't really tell what was on it, but I saw that it had my high school colors. I then instantly realized who it was, the junior that was the captain of the varsity football team. I was so curious so I slid to the next picture. He was grabbing her butt while hugging her and she was looking up at him like he was her husband. I was so shook and I had to screenshot. I keep scrolling through her Instagram and it's just her and this kid. Then I found the perfect picture. She was kissing him and it was definitely at a house party. I knew what I had to do. I had to screenshot this, then I quickly went on Facebook. I found pictures of her husband and he was tagged. I knew his name now so I looked him up on white pages. He lived at the same address as her so I had to do this during school. I found out where he worked and so I quickly printed out the pictures that I found. This was the best thing. I also planned to email the pictures to the school. She shouldn't suspend people for a stupid reason and she shouldn't be kissing her students. I went to sleep knowing this was going to work. I woke up between 9 and 10 a.m. that day and was ready for this. I grabbed my bike and biked the six miles to get to their house across the city. I'm on the varsity soccer team so I'm quite in shape. This took me about 20 minutes and when I got there I saw his car in the driveway. Great, he didn't leave for work yet. I simply just put the pictures in her mailbox, knocked on the door and biked off as quick as I could. I had to wait until at least 7 o'clock to email the school. I made an entirely new email address and emailed it at around 6.30 because I couldn't wait. They emailed back almost right away and said they would deal with it right away. Since today was my last day of being suspended, I was ready to go back to school tomorrow. After math, I woke up in the morning really happy and excited and I couldn't wait to see what was going to unfold. In our lunch, the assistant principal, along with a few teachers, walk around monitoring the lunch. I then see the principal, along with two police officers, 
pull the assistant principal and the student out. The whole lunchroom gets quiet and so many people are recording. I smirked really openly when I saw this happen. I asked one of the monitors to get a bathroom pass just so I could hear what was going on. He told me I couldn't go right now as something is going on. I was kind of sad about this but also happy. I knew what was going on but I couldn't tell anyone. Now some stuff happened in the next few days but I'll just sum it up. First day after, the day after it happened, she didn't show up but the student did. I asked him what happened, but he wouldn't say. All I knew is that he wasn't in trouble. That made me glad because he didn't have a reason to be in trouble, and that wasn't my goal. Five days after, since it was a four-day weekend that week as we had Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday off, we came to school back on Tuesday. I noticed her office was empty. I was really stunned that she got fired, and so I looked up our state's court case search. There was already one case, and it was hers. She had caused child 13 to 18 to view sex activity as the charges pressed against her. Three weeks later, the school wanted to hide this, so of course no news came out, but a new case has opened up. Her divorce case. I saw this and I instantly knew I succeeded. She should have never have been an assistant principal as she was extremely hateful and biased and even a perv. Now she's serving 10 months in prison and I don't feel bad at all. Nor should you, there's a very obvious power dynamic that makes it very, in most places, not illegal for that kind of relationship. That's also not ignoring the fact that this kid might not have been 18 yet. Which, the last time I checked, in most places is very illegal. Standing up to my workplace bully led to unforeseen consequences. Let me start this one out by saying that I fully intend to seek revenge on the person in this story, but the aftershock of the eventual confrontation is what led to the aforementioned consequences rather than by my direct actions. I work in the UK for a large technology company doing software support. I'm part of a team that has members all over the world. I've been in this job for around 10 years, and other than the major issues I've had with this guy, I truly enjoy my job. When I started with the company, I wouldn't say that I was green, I had about 7 years industry experience under my belt. I was definitely inexperienced with the company, but the job that I had been hired to do used technologies that I was more than comfortable with. The point I'm trying to convey here is that I wasn't completely oblivious to all of the applications supported by our company. Everyone on my team, around 30 of us, was very nice and was very keen to help, except for Shane. Shane is probably what you term as the team guru, about five years from retirement, part of the office furniture, metaphorically as we're all home workers. He'd been with the company for nearly 40 years. Everyone labeled Shane as the only guy to go to when you were truly in a bind. When I was initially starting out, I did indeed find that Shane was highly knowledgeable and more often than not, had the answers to whatever obscure questions you might have. Things were great, and our team ticked over nicely. I got to know the rest of the team well, over phone, over time too. And my best friend was a woman named Mel. She was of a similar age and experience level to Shane, and in my opinion, was just as as knowledgeable as him. One day, Mel and I were on a brief call chatting about a work issue when we got to shooting the breeze for a while. We talked about ourselves and also the team. I'd said that I hadn't met anyone face to face yet, and that was when she told me she'd once met Shane in person a couple of years ago. They were both based in the US, I'm in the UK, and both got invited to a tech conference in New York. She told me that he has serious health issues due to his weight, around 450 pounds, and when he was home, was often on oxygen and medication. His plan was to ride things out until he was able to take early retirement so that he didn't need to worry about paying for his medical insurance anymore. That sounded like a reasonable enough plan to me, and we were soon talking about something else. The issue started about two years into my tenure with the company. We started moving in a new direction with what applications we were going to be offering to customers, and towards the end, we were trained in a bunch of new stuff. I saw this as a great opportunity and equalizer. If no one on our team had any experience with this new software, then I would be on equal footing with everyone. This went really well for me, and I put a lot of time and effort into learning as much as possible. Shane didn't show much interest in the new stuff, he still continued to spend most of his time with the legacy tools. In team meetings, you could clearly tell he was getting pissed off that his status as a guru was gradually becoming more and more meaningless. This wasn't anything personal, we work in software, 
You have to adapt in order to remain competitive. As time went on, it was becoming clear to the team how much work I was putting in, and I was well on the way to becoming the go-to guy for the new software. During this time, Shane would start sniping at me for anything he could plausibly manage. For example, if I was late to a team meeting because a customer call overran, he'd make sure to interrupt whatever was being said to comment something like, Oh look, OP is bothered to grace us with his presence. Even though he'd been guilty of the same in the past, things like email chains too. Almost anything I sent out that included him and our boss on an email, he would reply with some unrelated complaint or observation, completely irrelevant to what was actually being discussed. One day, Mel called me and asked me what my beef with Shane was. I truthfully told her that I had no beef at all with him, and he just seemed to have it in for me. She said that if she managed to find anything out, she'd let me know. Things continued like this for a couple of years. I continued to be the go-to guy, and he continued to try and discredit me, and generally paint me in as bad a light as possible. One day, we had a major incident. One that literally could have cost the company millions in SLA fines if it was not solved quickly. Our manager split us into teams to troubleshoot specific areas, and she paired me up with Shane. I wasn't happy about it, but whatever, I was a professional. We got on a call and started working through the issue. As our call progressed, it was becoming abundantly clear why he didn't like me. He knew nothing about the new application. He hadn't done any work on it at all. Everything I asked him to check, he needed hand-holding even for the most basic of tasks. Eventually, I just shared my screen and said for him to watch me. I went into the guts of the system through so many logs, explaining to him what I was doing the whole time, and eventually found the problem was with a recent patch we had installed. At this point, he dropped from the call. I didn't think anything of this at the time. We use Skype for business and it can be flaky, so I just continued what I was doing. Our process was not to roll back any changes until it had been approved by the senior manager. As I was the one responsible for deploying or rolling back patches, made some notes about what we needed to do, and then rejoined the main call. I wasn't worried at all because bad patches happened every so often. They just didn't usually have this level of impact. As soon as I did, I got absolutely destroyed by the incident manager. Apparently Shane had returned to the group call and informed everyone present that the outage was caused by an error that I had made in the deployment process and that Shane had told me what the correct fix was and I had refused to implement it then and there. I was furious. He had accurately told them the cause of the problem because it was me who literally demonstrated to him how to find it. I had even foolishly mentioned to him what I thought would fix the problem. Because of how long he'd been with the company compared to me, only our immediate team knew the truth about who was really the better skilled person in this situation. His historical reputation still carried a lot of weight with people who didn't work day to day with him. Because this incident was so major, over a hundred people were on this call several of them two or three levels of management above our team. He made me out to be a reckless, incompetent idiot, and he was believed. Despite my manager's protests, I was disciplined and given a verbal warning. He, meanwhile, was congratulated for steering the company away from a potential disaster and given a commendation. I was so angry, and a while later, Mel gave me a call. Apparently, Shane had been bragging to her about putting that smart butt punk in his place. She was shocked and asked him what he was talking about. His real beef was that he thought I had disrespected him by trying to take over his role as the go-to guy for the new software. That wasn't my intention at all. I didn't see it as my fault that he was too darn lazy to do the work again. I lamented with Mel that she should have recorded the call. She laughed and said that Skype shows when you're recording a call, and he'd never have spilled his guts while being recorded. I immediately had a brainwave. I decided that I would confront Shane one-on-one. I pinged him on Skype and said that I wanted to talk. He responded with a smiley and just said, sure. I called him and let him know that I was recording this call. And the Skype notification popped up to let all participants know that this call was being recorded. I went right for it and accused him of lying about the major incident and said that it seemed like he had major beef with me. As expected, he lied and said that he was sorry that I felt like I had to react this way. He said that he would need to talk to our boss about it. I said, wait one second, and turned off the Skype 
Skype recorder. I then said that Skype isn't recording, and then he knew exactly what he had done. His mask slipped at this point, and he said that he was perfectly in his rights to put me in my place. He said that you need to respect the longer serving people in jobs like this, and that he would do it again in a heartbeat. I didn't hold back. I called him a dinosaur who refused to move with the times and wanted to coast out his days here without doing any work. He said that he was a couple of years away from retirement and he'd be darned if he was going to bust his butt for some shiny new software. I said to him, speaking of new software, has he heard of OBS? Of course he hadn't, and I suggested he Google it. I then hung up on him. Not long after, the messages started. He was begging me to not use the secret recording that I'd taken. He said that if he gets fired, he'll lose his retirement package and his medical benefits. I told him to go freak himself and that he should have considered that before trying to get me fired. I passed all of this on to the relevant channels before really giving it any thought. Things set in motion, and sure enough, a few weeks later, after a company investigation, he was fired. I heard from Mel that he asked to take an early retirement so as to keep his benefits, but this was apparently rejected. It all came out later that apparently he had significant debts and that he was counting on his retirement package to keep him financially afloat. With no job and no package, he had no money to pay for the medical treatment which he badly needed. He was in no state to get himself a new job and his skills had stagnated so badly that he couldn't even get a new job online. Mel told me that he died about six months after this whole incident due to his ongoing health issues. I felt conflicted about this for a while. Sharing that recording obviously contributed to his death, but I don't know how bad I feel about it. I'm a young guy trying to build my career and he actively tried to destroy me. I should maybe have held off when he pleaded for me to not reveal the truth, but he was old enough and wise enough to not engage in the childish games he played. If I'd known he'd been dead as a result of this, I'd maybe have done things differently. It's one that stays with me, that's for sure. I'm still at the company, and I can tell you that I will never treat a new employee the way he treated me. So maybe the breaking of that cycle is the positive to come out of all of this. So considering the end result here, do you think that in retrospect when the guy was pleading about I'll lose everything, I won't be able to afford medical treatments, that OP should have held off? Would that have been enough to change everything? I don't know. Or do you think, despite the outcome, that OP was completely right to just keep going forward with it? I'd like to know what you guys think in the comments down below. And our final story of the day is by Erichan89, how this client gets what's coming to him. Hey all, so I'm a freelance web developer. Had a guy contact me saying there was a small project he needed help with, stating it should take minutes and wanted to pay 50 bucks. Fair enough. He also states that he needs it done by the end of the day since he's apparently in a tight spot with his employer, so he needs it done fast. Also fair enough. I'm not going to turn it down just because it's a tight deadline. I get in and find out his previous developer was very sloppy and the code was darn near impossible to read. His site's in Squarespace and a lot of second-rate developers work there, which is fair because it's pretty easy. I tell the client this code is horrible and I need to reformat. Then it turns out the new links that he wanted in there completely broke everything. I told him that it would likely take about 6 hours to get all of this sorted out and he said that was fine and would compensate me accordingly by my hourly rate of $80 an hour. So I finish everything up, tell him the total of $640 and he agrees, says he can pay me the next day. This I'll pay you the next day BS goes on for about 2 weeks and I try to call him again on the most recent day that he said he'd pay me. Turns out he's now blocked my number. A couple days go by of trying to contact him while still getting nothing. I went to log into the site to cut my losses and delete my work. Turns out he's changed the password. At this point, it's clear to me this was planned, so I'm pissed. I email him stating that if I don't hear within 48 hours, I'll be serving him court papers and a demand of payment to his address that I had to find through an ancestry site and subsequently call his apartment complex to confirm before I serve some poor sap with random court papers. He does an email for 24 hours and this morning, I find out that I'm still logged into his site through the Squarespace app. Clearly this is a huge vulnerability in Squarespace since he had changed his password and I was still in on the app. 
I'll likely report this to them, but this is where my revenge comes into play. I created a new email that was his address at protonmail.com, which I then used to sign up for a new Squarespace account with, invited myself as a contributor so I can access on desktop as well, and set his live site as password protected. He sees this and is repeatedly emailing and texting me saying he can pay me 250 but 750 now with late fees, is just insane and way too much. Now, apparently he can pay me on Monday, which I've heard plenty of already. This pissed me off even more, so I stated I would continue adding late fees until he pays up, and that his site will continue to be mine. Now his site is indeed live again, but every page autoplays crappy SoundCloud wrappers, and all the links he had me place now take the user to cool math games. I considered P-Hub, but that's perhaps a bit much. I've never done this to other clients. But this dude is a 43-year-old piece of garbage. I should also state that I pride myself in work and generally run on a very professional level. However, I won't accept no payment and being jerked around for weeks. All I can say is I definitely support what OP was doing here. Pay your web developers and web designers because it's literally stealing otherwise. OP had posted some updates and basically got about $200 total from this guy over the next few months and could never get him to pay up the full amount and it's eventually going to go to a court case. So I hope it works out for OP. A family's incompetence nearly killed me. Neighbors go nuclear. A few years ago, at the age of 22, I was diagnosed with epilepsy which came out of the blue. In my appointments with the epilepsy nurse and my neurologist, I was informed, by way of informing those who were looking for a cause for my epilepsy, that I had suffered from measles when I was around 13 months old, and was not yet fully vaccinated against it. Upon returning home, I spoke with my sister and remarked that I had never heard of this before. In private, my sister decided that, as it was me who was involved, I had the right to know what she knew of the story. However, she was only 8 years old at the time and was unsure of the true extent of what had transpired. The story that she told me was as follows. Shortly after I was born, a family moved onto our street and they had a son who was around my sister's age. My sister wasn't fond of him, he was a bit pushy but not in an unkind way. He likely just wanted to make friends and pushed his way into playing with the other children. My sister however had an anxiety disorder and has had it for a long time. And she really didn't appreciate this behavior, finding him quite intimidating. She knew very little about his parents and has never actually spoken to them. About a year later, I came down with the measles and was rushed to the hospital with severe complications. My sister explained that, as far as she was aware, the family was opposed to vaccinations and believed that the only way to build a natural immunity was to be infected with a virus. This was before the falsified study linking vaccines to autism. As such, when their unvaccinated son contracted the measles, the first thing that they thought of was to do the other families on the street a favor and send their infectious son out to play with the other children without warning anybody. My sister inadvertently brought the virus into the house and we were both infected. She shrugged it off, but... I wasn't so lucky. 21 years later, I would find out that this virus and the seizures that it caused at the time caused scarring in my brain that has left me with epilepsy and all of the joys that come with that. Lovely stuff. I returned from the hospital after an anticlimactic recovery, and a month later, the family disappeared. Until recently, that was all I knew of the situation. My parents were understandably traumatized by the whole thing, and they didn't like to talk about it. So I dropped it into the conversation with an elderly neighbor who was not in any way affiliated with what happened at the time. I was informed that while I was in the hospital, who has since passed away, had confronted the family over what they had done during a time when it was still possible that I might have died. Their response was something to the effect of, you should be thanking us. She'll be much safer now that she's had it. She'll have a more natural immunity now. To my neighbor's knowledge, nobody liked that and for good reason. On top of that, parents didn't feel safe with them around and there were other infants on the street who were my age or younger. People hurtled abuse at them, he recalled, and they ended up leaving to stay with relatives before the house could even be sold. It was only recently that the extent of the abuse was relayed to me by another neighbor who may or may not have taken part in it all. Their tires were slashed multiple times, almost as soon as they were replaced. Their car was keyed. 
When people weren't hurtling abuse at them in the street, the worst of all being my grandmother, who had a razor sharp wit, always being able to come up with something new and unique, they wrote handwritten letters calling them every obscene name under the sun and reminding them that they could be responsible for my death posting them through their mailbox and sticking them to their windows and doors. The resident baseball boy, with the blessing of everybody present, tore their letterbox off their wall and smashed it in with a baseball bat. One of the residents on the street had a pair of cats, and when they brought any little presents home, she would scoop up the unfortunate prey with a shovel and leave them on their doorstep. This evolved to include the waste of the cats too, and another neighbor who had a dog decided to do the same with his dog's droppings. This would be done primarily when they were out of the house. And this was being done in the heat of the summer, so you can only imagine the smell and the cloud of flies that would be wafting around their porch when they returned hours later. The owner of the dog even went as far as to smear the droppings all over their door handle and as much of their front window as he could, though people found this a wee bit disgusting, so he stopped. While the abuse and letters kept up, people very quickly stopped leaving droppings and such on their porch or sticking the letters to their windows because, unfortunately, their young lad, who was about seven or eight, got caught in the crossfire. Some of the older children caught on to the fact that their parents didn't like his family and began to bully him without ever really knowing why his family was hated so much and this ended up reaching him at school. To their credit, they realized that he likely didn't understand what was going on, and it wasn't his fault. So they dialed it back a bit and kept the abuse to where only the parents could see. This family was so distressed that they took their son and ran to the sibling of one of the parents after the sibling of the other told them quite frankly that they didn't want their unvaccinated son around their children. The house was sold in their absence. I wondered aloud why the police weren't called because some of the perpetrators were very obvious, at which point I was informed that these people had an inherent distrust of any and all authority figures and held the belief that the system was against them. They were being oppressed and that the police would sweep it all under the rug, so they just left instead of exposing their son to the biased police which is really baffling to me because in my country their community is a majority and they'd be more likely to receive support so the moral of the story is to vaccinate your children folks considering everything this family did and what they believed in i don't think there was any saving these parents to me they seemed a bit too far gone as far as the conspiracy theories and people are out to get them and would you consider what these parents did to be kind of abusive towards the kid, especially in the long term? Or do you think it's just their decision and it's up to them? Let me know what you guys think in the comments. And our final story of the day is by throwaway by twin. I didn't give my twin brother my kidney because he had an affair with my girlfriend and then outed me as bisexual. I, Ryan, and my twin brother Sebastian have never ever been close. In fact, he made my life heck growing up and my parents didn't help by playing favorites, getting him better stuff on our birthday, only going to see films he liked at the cinema, and giving him extra money for housework despite us doing the same amount of work. He would always put me down, belittle me, bully me with his friends at school, break my stuff, and then blame me and was just a pain in general. Growing up, the only people I knew to rely on was my older sister Jane, my cousin Kai, and best friend Isaac, who all knew what an awful person my brother was. Anyway, cut to when I was 17 and I had my first girlfriend, someone I loved very much. We didn't hook up because she wanted to wait till her 18th birthday to lose it, but it turns out she was having an affair with my brother behind my back for half the time we were together and only got caught when it was revealed she was pregnant. I was crushed. She knew how much I hated my brother, and she saw some of the awful things he did to me, but still went and did that. Cheating is bad enough, but to do it with him of all people? I punched him in the face and broke his nose and made him lose a tooth. But according to my parents, I'm the one in the wrong, and now we have to help this girl who's carrying my brother's child and have to help support them. My brother then said he had no intention of being a father and told my girl girlfriend to get an abortion. She then ran out of town and I never saw her again. Don't know if she had the baby or not. All I know is that she was gone and my folks were still praising my brother as the golden child. 
I was still the black sheep and failure as usual. Another year goes past and me and my brother still despise each other but I had started dating again. Was a long while but I found someone. Found a boy I liked. I'm bisexual and this new guy Daniel I had met at college caught my eye. He was deaf and I studied sign language out of boredom so we got talking and things just seemed to click. We date, fall in love, bring him to my friend Isaac's party to introduce him to friends and all feels great. At this point the only one who knew I was bi was Isaac. But one day walking into a cinema holding my boyfriend's hand I bump into my evil twin. He points, laughs, and says some homophobic remarks. I tell him to go freak himself, and I go see a movie with my arm round my boyfriend. When I got home after dropping my boyfriend off, I knew I'd be facing something as I walked through the front door. I saw both my parents on the sofa, my mother crying about how on earth could she have given birth to someone so disgusting. Was it too much to hope she saw the light and was talking about my brother? But nope, she was talking about me and how I'm a stain on our family's name. My father gets up to yell at me, spout homophobic remarks and slurs. At this point, I see my brother up the staircase with a poop-eating grin on his face. He then comes down and says he's uncomfortable with sharing a room with an F word. And my folks kicked me out there and then. With what little clothes and money I had, I went to Isaac's house and his family took me in, where I stayed for six months actually experiencing familial love and affection. And Isaac's mother and stepdad, I consider my own parents now. Eventually me, Daniel and Isaac all get a two bedroom flat together and all is good for the time being. So cut to December last year, me and my boyfriend, now husband, Daniel are married. Isaac was my best man. My sister and cousin Kai walked me down the aisle. I have a brilliant job in graphic design, have my own house by the sea, and life has never been better. However, I got a call from my sister that my brother was in the hospital. I hadn't thought about him much over the nine year period since I was kicked out, but being reminded of his existence brought up a lot of painful memories for me. I was told by my sister that Sebastian wanted to see me and that it was urgent. So I went to the hospital he was in and met my sister outside the front entrance. I ask her what this is all about, but she doesn't tell me and that I need to ask my twin. So I arrive to where my brother is, who have my parents at his side, and my folks actually look happy to see me. As if what they did to me hadn't happened, and Sebastian also looked really pleased to see me. It's safe to say something was off. Eventually I ask what's going on, and why I was even here. To which my brother tells the family to leave us two alone. He looks so weak, as before he used to intimidate me so much. He told me he was dying from kidney failure and has been for the past few years, but now he didn't have long left. I knew immediately where this was going. He then said he always regretted that we never got along, at which point I told him no. He looked confused and asked about what I was on about, so I simply told him I wasn't going to donate my kidney to save him. He looked as if I had just pooped in his food. He then went on about how bad the situation was and that he was really sorry for all the things we did to each other growing up. Like, excuse me? We did to each other? I told him that I just wanted a brother growing up that cared and loved me who wouldn't try and break me every day for 18 years. He then called in our mom and dad and told them that I wasn't going to give up my kidney. They then started to spout off that I owed them for my existence and that I have a duty to look after family. I asked them where that duty was when they kicked me out of the house, or where that duty was every time my brother gave me a black eye, or their duty was to look after the grandchild when Sebastian decided he didn't want to be a father. I said for all the things he's done, from outing me to having an affair with my girlfriend and abandoning his child, that this was the universe's, and my, way of finally giving back what he dished out to bite him in the butt. I then turned and walked out of the room, having that be the last time I ever saw Sebastian again. Not sure why they'd want an F-word's kidney anyway. I walked past my sister who gave me a look. I gave her a look back, who then in turn gave me a look that said, I understand. After leaving the hospital, I felt as if a great weight had been taken off my shoulders. I went home and never looked back, pleased with my decision. Now last week, I get a call from my sister calling to inform me that Sebastian had died. She asked if I was okay, and I said I was. 
that I didn't really feel anything in all honesty. She said she understood to a degree, as Sebastian hadn't been all that kind to her over the years either. I had my husband and Isaac there to support me. Honestly, at this point, Isaac may as well be our adopted child since he's living with us till this whole situation with the world is over. The next day, I was getting calls and texts from family members I hadn't spoken to in years, telling me that I'm going to heck for being a bad son being a bad brother, and being an F-word, and that me and my husband don't deserve children. Hubby and I have been looking into adoption and surrogacy. This makes me second-guess my choice of not giving my brother a kidney. Even in death, he's making things harder for me. I did wonder if I was a bad person, and if I made the wrong decision, but I knew that if I was in that position, I would have been left for dead. Screw him. Other bits of information that may clear things up. His renal failure was from living a hardcore lifestyle of drugs and alcohol. My folks and sister did get themselves tested to see if they're matches, and none of them were. I disowned them being my family years ago, apart from Jane. So when I got married, I took my husband's last name and hyphened it with Isaac's last name, to which his folks were very pleased about. Some family, Kai's folks and my dad's brother, have actually called to see how I'm doing and say they don't judge me for what happened. Others, however, have continued with said abuse, whom I have now blocked. If he had been a good brother throughout my life, I'd have done it without a second thought. I'd have done the same for Jane, Kai, Isaac, and my husband. But I felt he didn't deserve it. It's unlikely I'll ever see my parents again, and I'll make sure my children will never meet them. My revenge to them will be being a better parent than they ever were. Honestly, I can't say that I blame OP either. This is one of those situations where, for almost two entire decades growing up, Throughout your developmental life, you were essentially tortured, you were looked down upon, your self-esteem was crushed, and then to top it off, they kicked you out and basically said to never come back. So it's no great surprise that later on when they're like, please, I need your help, we're family, the answer would be no because they never were truly family. Jerk gets publicly humiliated before the entire student body and his parents and grandmother. This story happened when I was in high school. I went to a smallish high school, around 950 students ranging from the 9th to 12th grade. With so many students in one place, I had quite a good few friends that I talked to, but only a handful that I hung out with and talked with on a daily basis. Now, there was a certain person in our social group, let's call him Bailey. Bailey was a social outcast by many people's standards. Not by bullying or hazing or mistreatment from the other students. It's just that no one really liked him because he was a jerk all the time. He was always playing the victim when he was rejected by girls. He threatened to ruin the lives of said girls who did reject him. He harassed girls online and touched them in uncomfortable places in person after being told to stop. Stomach, lower back, neck. He begged for money off of people. He was a sexist and racist person to all races and ethnicities. He put himself into other people's conversations and generally wasn't a very nice person to hang around. I have a really good friend, let's call her A. A has been my best friend ever since I can remember and she's a wonderful, sweet and generous person to everyone. One day before we got out for winter break, A came up to me in the hallway before the end of school, bawling her eyes out. I asked her to tell me what was wrong and she said that Bailey had asked her out before she went to her class over text. But when she declined after explaining that she already had a boyfriend, all heck broke loose. He called her a racist slur and a slur about being promiscuous. He said she should end herself because of how fat she was. He said no one loved her because she was a mixture of the two worst races and said that no one would want her because she's a C word and she has a stinky hoo hoo area. A had some insecurities about herself and Bailey hit every single one of them point blank. I was freaking seething with rage while reading her texts and I was completely appalled and disgusted at his behavior. I told her to dry her eyes and send me screenshots of the conversation he had with her. When she asked what I was going to do with them, I simply told her that I had enough of him harassing girls and I was going to do something about it. Now, I was not going to confront him directly, not with how angry I was at the moment. Instead, I decided to rally the troops and get ready for the bloodbath. I was going to massacre what was left of his entire high school career, his entire life. Now Bailey had done this to girls before, and luckily I had those girls' numbers saved in my phone because they're my friends and we would send each other memes. 
So I made a group chat and asked everyone to send any type of rude, racist, sexist, or failed attempt to be asked out screenshot over any type of social media that Bailey had sent to them. Over the next 15 minutes, my phone was blaring with text notifications. There were screenshots of Snapchat stories, Facebook comments, text messages. All in all, I had around 60 photos of sexist, racist, failed D pics or jerk comments and rants that he made to 15 females, including myself. Over winter break, I composed all of those screenshots into a nice little PowerPoint and saved it in my flash drive on my laptop. I spoke with our principal and I asked him if I could show him something relevant to the safety of the student body during his free break at lunch. He told me that he had no problem with it and a time was set. When it finally comes down for my meeting with the principal, I have a small parade of girls behind me who wanted to come testify, anxiously holding onto each other's hands. We were invited into the principal's private conference room as he sets up his laptop and plugs my flash drive in to connect it to the projector. The principal called in some teachers to be witnesses and called Bailey down to the conference room to take a seat and to try to defend himself if the allegations weren't true. The principal clicks the remote to play my presentation and it slowly begins to load up. The first slide comes up and the room goes deathly silent besides a few gasps of shock. As the slides continue on, I notice Bailey squirming around in his seat, uncomfortable, and the people in the room are getting more agitated and angry. Halfway through the slides, Bailey jumps to his feet and throws his arms in front of the projector screen to censor out a particular image that he had sent to a girl, even though she had blurted out, ahem, a D pic. He tried to explain that he was joking with the comments about race and being a guy or girl, and that these girls were framing him for something he didn't do. He pointed to me and said that I was the ringleader of this operation and that I should be the one who was being thrown on the spot, not him. The entire room was tense, and the principal turned on the lights with his hands on his hips and a giant sigh. The principal turns to me and tells me thank you for bringing this to his attention, and he asks if he could take the flash drive and use it for the investigations and alleged rumors that were going on about Bailey. I gave it to him, and he thanked me again before he left with Bailey and the teachers in tow. Since I copied the original slideshow to my cat flash drive, I sent the PowerPoint to not only mutual friends at the school, but also to his mom and dad through Facebook. All of them were not only absolutely disgusted by his comments, but his family was extremely distraught but thankful I brought this up to their attention. A few days later, the entire school was summoned to the gym for an announcement. Bailey was there with his parents on either side of him and his frail grandmother on the small stage we have set up for concerts and band productions. The slideshow is playing on repeat on a projector in the background for everyone to see. The principal said a few words about how harassment in any shape, form, or fashion would not be tolerated and neither would sexism or any form of racist behavior or comments. The principal made Bailey apologize publicly to the school about his behavior and how he would never do it again. His parents were embarrassed, but they also apologized to the school and to the young ladies that he had harassed. His grandmother did not let him off so easily. She slapped his knee with her cane hard and started yelling at him for being so disgusting and such a disappointment to her and the rest of the family. Bailey started to cry on the stage as his mother and father tried to calm down his grandmother. Once everything calmed down, they were escorted off the property. He was suspended for the rest of the year for verbal harassment and racist comments. Later on in the same year, I found out that he tried to rob a grocery store and was now facing trial for battery, assault with a deadly weapon, and armed robbery. My friends and I all graduated happily, and I never saw Bailey again. I'm kind of curious what you guys think. Do you think this public display of what Bailey said, putting them up on stage with their family in front of the entire school, do you think that was the right thing to do or a good thing to do? Or do you think Bailey should have just gotten quietly expelled and totally removed from that system? Or maybe even something else? I'd like to know what you guys think in the comments down below. Our next story is by MindChaser05, entitled Family Trespasses, So We Total Their Car. So in our state, you can skin a deer in your yard as long as it's a bit out of sight. You don't have to as law enforcement don't care much. Me and my grandpa go hunting every once in a while for whitetail, then we take it back and skin it, 
gut it, and all that. We had just got a nice buck and we had it registered. When you kill it, you have to make sure people know. So after we got back to our house, we set the deer up in our backyard away from the road. We figured we didn't want kids seeing what we were doing, so we could skin it, gut it, all the nice stuff. So we headed up on the line that we set up that went from our porch to a nearby tree. It was maybe 50 feet. Mind you, our house is a T kind of shape. One side's towards the road, and the other side is away. We had it set away. So my grandpa gets his knife, and we work the fur coat off. We don't hear anyone around until... Entitled Kiddo says, Whoa, what's that? So cool! I was shocked. Why in the heck was there a kid behind our house? The pelt was almost off, so we laid that over our Jeep bumper. Now my grandpa can't hear very well without his hearing aid, which he took out for a second because it was hurting his ear. I tug on grandpa's coat, He looks at me with a shrug. I motion for him to put his hearing aid in. He does. I try to tell them about Entitled Kiddo, but he must have run off. Now that Entitled Kiddo was gone, we continued. My grandpa sticks the knife in the deer and he slices it open. The guts go everywhere. My grandpa gets to cutting them out when Entitled Mom screams, What are you doing? Now, just for clarification, we have a fence and a private property sign up. Grandpa says, Where are you back here? This is pri- Entitled Mother jumps in, Shut up with your devil chance. I say, This is private property. We'll call the police. Entitled Mother looks a little scared but yells, Shut up. My kid can be here. Mind you, her kid is behind her and he started crying. She said, Look what you did. You made him cry. Me and my grandpa are baffled. But since we live in the country where there's no rhyme or reason to be out here, he grabs his shotgun. Grandpa does it like in the movies where he pulled up and slammed it down to pump it. I'm in awe because I've never seen someone do that. The entitled mother just took off. She took entitled kiddo by the arm and ran. Now you think she would be smart enough to stay away. No, she didn't. Now we're taking the guts away and she pulls up in her minivan behind our house. Mind you, this blocks our vehicle's path out. So since this is private property, we can block her vehicle since she's trespassing. My grandpa signals me to put out some cinder blocks behind her vehicle and tires. Now she honks her horn like she just found out what a goose is and is trying to act like one. She keeps going and all the while she's smiling. Since our house is a giant T, I walk around and grab some cinder blocks from the front. I sneak a peek at her vehicle. It's like a freaking clown car. Entitled mother gets out, then entitled father, then entitled kid, and then three god darn others. My grandpa noticed them get out and stops what he's doing. I sneak behind her vehicle once they all get out. I lay four down behind her tires and stack some. I also make the cinder blocks barrier longer, so now you have like 12 cinder blocks completely stopping her from leaving. I walk back around and go upstairs. I walk out onto the patio and down to where my grandpa is. They're all arguing. My grandpa grabs his shotgun again. They all back up and get in their vehicle. They keep honking and my grandpa shoots into the ground in front of their car. Entitled mother speeds back. Her tiny car can't get over the cinder blocks. She tries to go forward, but my other line I laid stopped her. My grandpa laughs and laughs. Entitled mother throws it back. Crunch, smash. Her vehicle was totaled. When she got over the bigger line, her car plopped onto the bricks. She gets out and yells, What have you done? You're going to pay. Grandpa keeps laughing. Entitled father says, I'm calling the police. He called the cops. Entitled kid cried. And they got arrested for trespassing and harassment. Pretty short story, but well worth it. I mean, you're out in the wilderness and somebody's skinning a deer. What does it look like they're doing? What is this family doing strolling up here, the entire family? These people very clearly just were not very smart. And our final story of the day is by Chewbacca Gaiman. Don't pay me? I'll ruin your business and have you fined. So this happened a few months ago around November 2018. I was working at a small cafe as a kitchen porter. Basically washed dishes and helped out every so often in the kitchen. Anyway, I was supposed to be paid a week in hand a week after I get paid. As an 18 year old in college at the moment, I was more than happy getting about 50 pounds a week for a few hours of honestly easy work. One week, I didn't get paid and asked my boss what was happening. And he just told me to bear with him as he had to do something quickly. I complied and he asked me to cut up some chicken and veg whilst he had to quickly pop out. I go into the kitchen, 
opened the fridge that was supposed to be for chicken only and saw that it had a tray of just raw chicken sitting in blood with veg. Although I wasn't that involved in catering as much as I was a few years ago, I still knew this was disgusting and a clear breach of food safety. I quickly snap a picture of everything that was just absolutely disgusting and against health and safety regulations and took as many photos as I could. Somehow some of the photos got corrupted so I only had two of them. Fast forward to the next week and I asked my boss again when I was getting paid. This was getting close to Xmas so I kinda needed the money for presents. He also owed me about 160 pounds at this point as I did some overtime and told me that if I came to see him on the Saturday coming up, was a Thursday at the time, then he'll be able to pay me then. I messaged him on Saturday asking where he was, and he just replied he'll be there in 5. 30 minutes pass, and he finally shows up and just gives me 50 pounds in cash and basically started to walk off. I asked him about the other 100 pounds, and basically, he just said that the shop was being closed for some electrical reworks and that he'd be able to pay me then. Now, my mom walks past this cafe on her way back from work and taking my sister to hockey training. And every time she did, she saw the place open with a few people, not customers, just chilling. She tells me, and I'm annoyed. So I plot. My mate just suggests jokingly to put a brick through his windows and then ask for the money, or to just report him to both environmental health and the tax man, as he was paying me in cash, no wage slip. Basically, he was paying me illegally and tax-free. I couldn't go to the tax man as I'd be screwing myself over too, but... I like the idea of environmental health, still had those pics. I make a report and receive a response basically saying how they'd look into it and that they were grateful as this was actually the second store he owned that has been reported. The first one was closed but not told why. A week or so passes and basically the shop is never opened and my mate looked into the charges that we knew he'd get along with any others that he may get. Needless to say, it's most likely more than a 100 quid. Yeah, the guy deserved every bit of this nuclear revenge. Not only were they illegally paying their people and stiffing them to boot, honestly if he was paying the people it wouldn't really bother me, but not only that, they were endangering anybody that remotely ate at that place because of terrible cross-contamination. There's basic rules about like raw stuff not being near or above cooked stuff or whatever, but this is just like vegetables in the same tray as the raw chicken in the raw chicken's blood. It's like holy moly, that place was bound to get shut down. My performance review that became my manager's performance review. I was the top salesperson, by a large margin, at a location that was vastly underperforming. I was working with a business-to-business sales company. We sold services to companies, basically. And this company had managed to hire the most incompetent, lazy, and jealous sales manager I've ever come across. We were a team of five salespeople and a sales manager. All five of us salespeople hated our sales manager for various reasons, but we liked her personally. I was the top salesperson of the team. I was sitting at 170% of my yearly objective and was well on my way to President's Club. This is largely because I was the only salesperson on the team with real sales experience and the sales manager was too incompetent to train a team. So my VP came down for our yearly performance reviews and I was called in first. It was my VP and Mrs. B, short for which, I was expecting a positive performance review. Right off the bat, Mrs. B hits me with, OP, you know our location hasn't been performing at objective for a number of years, and we suspect this is because salespeople are misrepresenting their daily work. I'm taken aback. OP, I don't think you're actually doing what you say you're doing in your CRM. This is something that could get you fired. I looked at Mrs. B and I said, Really? She said, yeah. I hit her back with, I'm shocked you decided to go this route. Mrs. B with a confident smile said, we gotta do what it takes to get this location on objective. I said, all right, let's play a game. Mrs. B, pick a day, any day in the CRM, and let me prove to you that I went to all my appointments and did all my stops as recorded. Well, OP, I'm not saying you never go in the field. I just think some days you stay at home and put in BS notes in the CRM. I said, Mrs. B, pick a day, any day. Pick a day you think I lied about my sales activities. So Mrs. B picks a day. Now I'm smiling ear to ear and I'm freaking heated right now. I notice the VP smiling at me and his head is slanted to one side. 
I suspected he knew Mrs. B was about to get absolutely freaking owned, and he was right. So she gives me the day, and I turn to VP. Mr. VP, are you aware of how Android phones work? VP responds, enlighten me. I said, by default, Android has location services turned on. And in fact, Google will track where you went and when. Naturally, I carry my phone everywhere, so let's compare what Google says I did that day to what my CRM says. So I pull up my Google location services for that day, and surprise, surprise, is a match. Mrs. B is obviously very concerned at this point. I said, I'm actually quite enjoying this performance review. Let's pick another day, Mrs. B. Mrs. B fires back, we don't need to do that. I turn to the VP and say, Mr. VP, would you mind picking a day? He says, sure, what about XYZ? He pulls up my CRM. I pull my location services for that day. Guess what? It's a match. I then get ready to pull out the big guns. Mr. VP, do you remember company XYZ with a contract value of excess of 1 million that we lost recently? They say, yes, OP, I remember. Apparently our competitor won them over on price. We can't win them all. I say, Mr. VP, here's an email from their VP basically stating that they've decided to not go with us for our failure to provide three samples for them to decide on which product worked best for them. They say, OP, can you forward that to me? Sure, not a problem, Mr. VP. Forward it over. I say, Mr. VP, while I'm at this, let me forward you over several email chains before this where I clearly asked Mrs. B to order those samples. In fact, in those very same email chains, she confirmed that she had in fact ordered the sample. He asked me to forward those emails, so I did. Now, Mr. VP, I have one more thing I'd like to bring to your attention. Do you mind if I step outside for a minute so I can show you? He said, sure. I need to have a talk with Mrs. B anyway. Now, I need to mention that several years prior to this, a general manager at another location assaulted a woman. The company was sued and lost a lot of money because of this. Since this incident, the company put in a very clear-cut policy. No relations between management and people who work for them. It's immediate termination for the manager. Now, another sales consultant in the office was named Joe. Joe was a married man with two beautiful kids and Mrs. B had the hots for him. She tried to hook up with him multiple times, twice on text. Joe and I had talked about if he should report this transgression. I walked into the sales office and said, Joe, I think it's time we get a new sales manager. You got those texts? He looks at me and goes, is today going to be the day? I said, today is going to be the day. All the sales staff knew what was going on. The mood in the office was lifted. Joe and I begin walking back to the conference room when the location manager, who was not part of the performance review, saw Joe and I and he asked, what's going on? Joe said, you're going to need to hire a new sales manager soon. Location manager was confused. He said he's coming into the meeting. We said, fine. I knocked on the door. Mr. VP said, come on in. So I did. There we stood, Joe, myself, and the location manager. Mrs. B knew exactly what was about to happen. We all took our seats, and I asked the VP, Mr. VP, I just want to clarify a company policy. They say, sure. I say, is it true that if a manager tried to engage in a sexual relationship with a direct report, that it's immediate termination for that manager? Mr. VP sits up straight takes a moment and goes, yes, if something like that came to my attention, my hands would be tied. I'd have to fire the manager. I said, well, Joe has something he wants to show you. Mrs. B got up and walked out of the conference room. She was about to cry, you could tell. Her world, her career had just completely wrecked, and I don't think she wanted to be around for the end. Joe went on to tell the VP how he's a happily married man with two beautiful kids, and Mrs. B kept hitting on him. In fact, she had sent him numerous sexual texts, and on two occasions openly invited him to come hook up with her, once in the office and once at his home, even after he made it clear he wasn't going to hook up with her. Mr. VP asked to see the texts, and Joe provided them. The VP asked him to screenshot those and email those over. Joe said he would. Then the VP said, I'm going to need both of you to go back to the sales office. The location manager and I have some talking to do. We walked back into the sales office. 
I noticed the sales manager office had looked cleaned out. Apparently Mrs. B was bawling. She was a wreck and crying and said she was going home. Joe laughed and said, yeah, she won't be coming back. It was about 20 to 25 minutes when the VP came into the sales office and asked me to come to the conference room again, so I did. I sat down and the VP said, well, I would like to inform you that Mrs. B has been terminated effective immediately. With this being said, after your performance review and looking over your numbers, you are our top sales rep in this location and deserve nothing short of stellar remarks on your review, and you'll be getting that. I said, thank you. I do have one question. He said, sure, anything. I ask, how do I apply for the new sales manager job that just opened up? Mr. VP laughed and said, you sure do like to strike while the iron's hot, don't you? I said, I do. He said he would let the location manager know and I'd be able to put in my application. I thanked him and he said, no, thank you. In my 35 years of being in sales and sales management, that was by far the most interesting performance review I have ever witnessed. I did not end up getting promoted. I ended up quitting shortly after because they decided to not promote me and instead hired a guy with no sales experience to be our sales manager and this rubbed me the wrong way. Also, our service department sucked and couldn't deliver on what I was selling and another company offered me more money. If you were working at a place where you hated your manager and they had a very strict policy that said any manager should have no relations with any other employee or else it's immediate termination and you had evidence of them attempting something like that, would you feel any remorse about reporting them and watching them get terminated on the spot? Or considering it's a manager you wouldn't have liked, would you just not care? Let me know what you guys think is the right thing and what you would do in the comments down below. And our final story of the day is by an anonymous poster, Crappy Customer Gets Vandalized. I work at a restaurant where the employees are overworked and underpaid. Despite this, everyone's cool with each other and management. The evils that mess up our day are the customers and our by-the-book district manager who drops by every now and then. For about three months, we had someone in the men's bathroom come in and smear an ungodly amount of fecal matter all over the handicap stall of the men's bathroom. Even sometimes they'll fling scat outside of the stall onto another toilet or a wall. Of course, management sends one of us peons to clean it up. Fortunately for me, I never had to as I worked the cash register. The one coworker who we'll call Arthur was who I'd call the personification of pettiness. He was crazy and had a smart mouth and an explosive temper when pushed too far. Me and Arthur were cool. I never had problems with him, but management always had him clean out the bathroom when it was poo smeared. One day, Arthur came in on his day off to get some food. After placing his order, he went to use the restroom. While there, he heard someone moan and groan having a massive poop storm in the handicap stall. He didn't think much of it, even when he smelled that god-awful scent. An older gentleman around 50 exited the stall. Arthur came out and noticed the smell was even stronger than before. Curious, he peeked into the stall and noticed the poop smears all over the place. Infuriated, he asked the old man if he had done that and why would he even? The old guy said with a scat-eating grin, Look, I don't care. I just want to ruin some poor freaker's day. Arthur was set the freak off, as he was that poor freaker. Initially, Arthur wanted to clock the guy right then and there, but in his own words, time slowed down around him and all he saw was red. Arthur didn't say anything to the man. Instead, he washed his hands and sat back down waiting for his food. He sat on the opposite end of the restaurant, but the location provided an overview of the entire floor. He could see the old guy at his booth munching away like nothing happened. Of course, someone complained that there was poop smeared all over, and one of the other employees that Arthur was cool with had to go clean up the mess. Arthur caught the old guy looking on at the situation and grinning to himself. Seeing that, Arthur thought the man needed to be taught a hard and hurtful lesson. The old guy finished his food and drove home. Little did he know that Arthur was following him. He ends up following the old guy to his home and stakes it out for an hour. Arthur does this for a couple of weeks, following him home, learning about this guy as quick as possible. Even on days off, he drove over to where he lived and followed him to both the restaurant and to his, old guy's, company. Arthur had gotten a rough idea of this guy's work and sleep schedule, so it was time to enact his revenge. 
Going by the information he acquired about the guy's activities and the neighborhood he lived in, Arthur figured out that this guy lived well enough to survive, but had no means of backup if something were to happen. Arthur had a three-part plan for him. First act, in the dead of the night, Arthur went to the old guy's house. He slashed one of the tires. The old guy drove a jeep, so Arthur opened the spare tire compartment and poked a small hole in it. The old guy woke up the following morning to find his tire flat. According to Arthur, the old man was on the phone freaking out because he was going to be running late for work and really didn't have the money to get a new tire. Not only that, to Arthur's surprise, the old guy didn't know how to change a tire. The old guy spent nearly two hours in the hot Texas morning heat on the phone with someone on how to put the spare tire on. This is important for later in this act. At this point, Arthur's foaming at the mouth with excitement. The old guy drove on the spare to work, only to find out that afternoon that the spare went flat. Even more frustrated, the old man drives the car to a nearby auto shop to get both tires serviced. Later that night, this time, Arthur slashed three out of four of his tires. Remember when old guy was on the phone getting instructions on how to get his tire fixed? Well, before that, he had called his car insurance company to get someone to come out and fix his tire. He was very loud, and the gist of the conversation was that the insurance company wouldn't come out and fix his tire and couldn't get them insured because all four tires weren't blown out. They said it would be easier and less expensive to just change the tire himself and get another. So later that night, Arthur slashed the other three tires, save for the new one. Arthur wasn't there the following morning, but he knew that the old guy surely had a meltdown. That, and he didn't show up to the restaurant for a month. Second act, piggybacking on the first act, Arthur would regularly check on old guy's car. When all the tires were replaced, Arthur went to the old guy's house late at night and poured a gallon and a half of sugar and bleach into the gas tank. His car had one of those manual gas covers instead of the modern button inside the car, so no one was none the wiser. In the morning, during Arthur's stakeouts, the old man started his car up and left for work, only to get halfway there before the car stopped working. So, old guy had to get his car towed to his house. The final act, Arthur got the old guy's name from the phone conversation and searched him on Facebook. He downloaded a couple of good pictures of him and created a few flyers. Due to the old guy's car being unusable, he wasn't able to come into the restaurant to do his usual crap, pun intended. Arthur printed the flyers out and posted them all over the restaurant. The flyers had a picture of the guy, his name, and described what he did in the bathrooms for the past few months. A few days later, the old guy comes in with a friend. The friend goes ahead and orders while the old guy runs to the bathroom. One of the co-workers spotted him and notifies everyone there, including the friend. Old guy starts to do his thing in the stall until he sees the flyer with his face on it. He storms out of the bathroom, flyer in hand, angrily demanding for the person responsible to step up to him. Arthur steps up in his uniform and claims responsibility. The old guy begins threatening to sue for slander and emotional damages and other offenses, to which Arthur simply says with an equally scat-eating grin, Look, I don't care, I just want to ruin some poor freaker's day. Old guy's soul momentarily leaves his body as he realizes that the same guy he confessed his crime to weeks ago was one of the employees. The managers arrive and ban the old guy from the restaurant. The old guy threatens to ram his car into the windows, to which Arthur says, Is your car a unicycle? Better check your tires, you poor freaker. Old guy then realizes that Arthur was behind the attacks. Banned from the restaurant, no hard evidence of Arthur's vandalism, and extreme embarrassment, old guy decides to bow out. Haven't seen or heard from him since. Unfortunately, fast forward a month and two nights ago, Arthur got arrested from fighting an off-duty officer at a convenience store. This story was a roller coaster and insane, like the lengths Arthur went to. All that, and they pulled all of it off, and then at the very end, OP's like, yeah, they went and fought an off-duty officer, so they got arrested. Considering all the stuff Arthur did in this story, it's somehow both an absolute surprise that they fought that officer at a convenience store, yet actually just makes so much sense. Arthur's a crazy dude. Harass your classmates? 
Think twice, hun. This is kind of a long story, but here goes. This happened back in high school about four years ago. I was involved, but another girl exacted the revenge that the rest of us were begging for. I'm gonna call the antagonist AP, her initials. I go to school with AP. She's 16 and in the year below. Met her in anatomy class. She's nice to me and we get along. Tells me she's bisexual and I mean, I'm totally cool with that, but I don't know why she told me. I see her here and there and we hang out at the homecoming game. AP starts leaning against me as if I'm her significant other. Think this is weird, but I'm like, whatever. I get up at one point. She takes this as rejection. I say this because of the way she acts when people are upset with her or can't hang. When I get home that night, AP texts me says she's gonna end it all and asks why I didn't hold her and stuff like that. AP asks why I don't love her and says she thought I was her girlfriend. I may be bisexual too, but I'm not interested in her in that way. She also tells me she was assaulted multiple times and stuff like that. She only ever said she was assaulted in the past when she felt rejected. I feel bad for her and tell her I'm sorry if I hurt her feelings, but I'm still weirded out by her behavior. Hang out with her more and she keeps leaning on me, hugging me and putting her hands on me. Same routine every time. I reject her, she threatens ending it all, and I apologize when really I'm trying to get her away from me. Cue the final straw. I'm in anatomy class one day and she touches my butt, like dead center. I jump and turn to her, I get up in her face and I tell her, don't ever freaking do that again. At this point I'm about to flip out. I know it's not the worst thing that could have happened, but I feel violated and I hope to god no one saw her do that to me. Now, I have never said anything like this to anyone, but this had gone on for a few months and I was on edge. Didn't speak to her for a while. You may be wondering, didn't she say something to a teacher? Yes, I told my teacher and a counselor that she was harassing me, sending me photos, touching me, threatening self-harm. The teacher just gives me a look of, what do you want me to do about it? Counselor tells me to tell AP to leave me alone. I didn't want her to get in too much trouble, but I wanted her to get help. I was fuming at this point and I went home, tell my mom what happened, and she was livid. Tells me to stay away from her, and I'm thinking, you don't have to tell me twice. Move on to the next block. In the second block of my senior year, I'm in stagecraft class. We're in the middle of working on our set for Little Shop of Horrors. Everything's going well and our set looks insane. We even get the Audrey 2 prop from Broadway. One day, teacher announces that we have a new student. I'm hoping that we'll get along nicely. Who is it? AP. She walks in and sits at the same table as me. She hangs out with my friend who I'll call Evie. Evie's being nice to her and I don't say a word to AP. I don't even look up. Later, we go to work on the set and I go to my teacher. I ask her if she won't make me do jobs with AP as I've had issues with her in the past. Teacher is super nice and understanding and says she won't. I thank her and move on. Work with EV and EV tells me that AP is being weird. I tell her I figured and ask her why. EV tells me that AP was talking about her period in detail out of nowhere and tells EV that she was assaulted by a classmate in another class. Now, I'm not usually one of these people. But I don't believe a word of what AP had said to EV. I tell EV to avoid AP. We go on with our day and I'm chilling out with my guy friend AR. AR is this really nice and funny ROTC kid. Unicorn of my heart I tell you. AR tells me that AP has been getting handy and flirty with him. He hates her too. We hang out a lot and she practically follows him around like a puppy. Even at her workplace. She kind of moves onto some ex friends of mine. Whatever, out of my life. Now, I previously said that she was sending photos. I deleted my Snapchat to get this girl off my back because she kept sending them. And as previously stated, she's 16 at the time. The photos she sent me were inappropriate, like pics of her in short shorts, tank tops, low-cut dresses, etc. Turns out, I wasn't the only one she sent pics to. The pics she sent to others were worse. One day, her friend gets mad at her, like fuming mad. AP had sent her some photos as well. AP's friend is hungry for revenge at this point. I don't know what AP did to her, but it must have been bad. AP's friend goes on Facebook, gets on AP's page, and posts the pics. I mean hundreds of them. 
everywhere. Her friends and family see them, relationships ruined, she became an embarrassment. Now, I don't advocate this behavior at all, but this is why we don't harass people with photos and inappropriate sexual behavior. If AP's friend wanted revenge, that's on her. Short of going to the police in the situation, they kind of exhausted what they could. Talk to parents, talk to teachers, talk to counselors, none of them actually offered any help. Considering all the creepy and weird behavior AP put out towards a lot of people, do you feel bad for AP at all? Knowing that all the unsolicited pictures she sent to people were pasted all over Facebook? Let me know down in the comments. And our final story of the days by Captain Chronicle, never steal from a mechanic. Okay, so I shared my little story to a few friends in a Discord and was told to share it with you fine people. This all happened a little over 10 years ago when I was just starting out on my mechanic career. It's a bit of a long read, but I believe it's worth the time. Due to the nature of the story, some parts and locations will be vague. Looking back now, I probably went a little too far at first, but apparently fate had other plans in the end. So to start off a little backstory, I grew up on a farm in the East Coast. Lots of hard work with no pay, and being from a less fortunate family, we never had much. Growing up this way helped me appreciate what little I had though. Once I was 16, I bought a car with a blown motor and rebuilt it while in auto class. I loved that car. While working for an auto parts store, my mother decided to move down south, parents were divorced long ago, and since my stepmother was a total witch, druggy, ruined my father's business, that kind of witch, I decided to leave everything behind and move in with my mother a few states away a few months after turning 18. I barely had enough to get there. Once there, I helped pay the bills with my auto parts store job. For Christmas that year, mom couldn't get me anything, we were barely getting by, so I scraped up enough to get myself a stereo for my car. A cheap one, but nice to 19 year old me, and her, a gold plated cross necklace she hung on her rear view mirror. She cried when I gave it to her and still tears up when I talk about it. We lived in a trailer park surrounded by trees covered in Spanish moss, hidden from the main road and a few miles away from the nearest town. We knew our neighbors well, as there was only around 8 other trailers on the slot. Nice people, apart from the one that was next to us, I'll call him Chad. Chad was in the military and worked on a nearby base. He was also an MP. As such, he never cared when him or his buddies were being too loud at night, left trash everywhere and refused to clean it up, and generally was just a jerk to everyone. He even cussed out a 90 year old lady for asking him to clean up the beer bottles him and his friends threw into her rose garden. The whole neighborhood hated Chad and his jerk friends. One spring, I blew a head gasket in my car. So I was in my little driveway parked next to my mom's car. Her boyfriend's truck was parked in front of the trailer, out of the way. Anyway, late one night as I was working on my car, Chad's buddies were making their drinking rounds, walking all over the park, throwing bottles everywhere, peeing on cars, being jerks. They saw me working on my car and came right over to make fun of me for being poor, not having a better car, still living with my mom at 19, everything. I tried to just ignore them since I was not a confrontational person. I asked them to let me be so I can get this done. To this, they just made a bit more fun of me and left when they realized they weren't getting a reaction from me. Later on, they all went into Chad's trailer and continued partying, so I packed up my tools and parts and took everything inside, ensured all our doors were locked, and went to bed. That morning, I woke up to all our car's doors opened and them ransacked. I was pissed! Missing was my stereo, my mom's gold cross, and her boyfriend's truck stereo. Was an expensive HUD style. We called the cops and they didn't want to do anything about it. As the donut patrol was talking to me saying, this isn't worth the department's time, something in me snapped. I politely said, okay, I get it, we'll be sure to keep a watch out for next time then, and the cops left. I went inside and started thinking of how I was going to get even. No one will make my mom cry. So I went to Chad's door and asked him where our stuff was. He was hung over and I woke him up at 7am. He was not happy, but let it slip that he doesn't know where his friends took it to. So I had him. I told him he has 24 hours and nothing will be done. He laughed it off and slammed the door in my face. It was on. Later that night came a huge storm. Heavy rain, lots of thunder, the works. So at 1am, I dressed up in some old clothes and thermals, grabbed my tools, and went out to his car. He had a nice new little Nissan, and to me it looked a little too nice. I got under it and took off everything I possibly could without being caught. I unbolted every nut, 
cut every wire, cut a few holes in the gas tank, sliced his tires from the inside side walls, took off the oil pan. I went ape crap on this poor little car. My father was a mechanic for many years, and growing up with him, I learned a lot about how to destroy a car without being noticed. Thanks to the storm, Chad never heard a thing. After a few hours of getting my revenge, I went back inside and cleaned up. Tossing my clothes in the wash and going to bed happy, I was able to cause him some peril. The next morning, I wake up to the blissful sounds of him cursing and punching his car that had no chance in heck of ever working again. All those parts of his, I threw into a small pond just over the fence near the edge of the lot. They'll never be found. He was so pissed, he broke all the glass and dented several body panels. The cops were called and they asked around. Everybody said he had anger issues and was within reason that he would take it out on his own car. Or his wife, who was hardly around due to him being him, but they had a kid so I guess they were making it work somehow. The cops being the lazy jerks I knew them to be from the day before, didn't do a thing and chalked it up to him having issues and left. Any other revenge story, this would be it, right? I got my revenge and he has to pay. Oh, but as fate would have it, I was but a cog in life's plan to give him what he had coming. I never planned this part, but it makes me smile every time I think back. So since he didn't have a car anymore, he had it towed off, his wife, at least I thought it was his wife, would come over to have some loud open window sex. One thing that perplexed me is, there was no kid in tow as usual, and her voice was different. So I got a webcam and set it up in my window, a perfect spot to see who was coming in and out and hear all the juicy bits of their lovemaking. Thing is, there were several different girls coming over when I was gone to work. Since old Chad didn't have a car now, he had to have his affairs do house calls apparently. After a little over a month, I compiled every girl, every raunchy sex section, and every front porch kiss goodbye into a folder and caught his wife bringing their son by when he was out one evening. I asked her to come in and I showed her the clips. She was livid. She was so pissed she called her dad and ordered a U-Haul. I helped her gather anything she said was hers, including a 55 inch TV. It was 2009, those were still very nice. The fridge and even the washer and dryer. She gave me a hundred bucks for my time, hugged me, and thanked me over and over for letting her know just how much of a jerk he really is. That's when I told her he did me wrong too and explained what had happened to me and my family. She was slack-jawed and called her dad again. She told me this wasn't over and she felt so bad for us having to deal with them. An hour later, she came back with her dad and he gave me another 200 bucks and said he was very appreciative that someone did the right thing. He shook my hand, thanked me again, and I never saw him after. The most amazing thing was when Chad came home after drinking and realizing all the stuff was gone. He destroyed the trailer, kicked out the walls, windows, ripped off the door, everything. Cops were called again by the old lady neighbor and he was put in cuffs and taken away. He was never heard from again, but I was told from the nice landlord who owned the whole lot, he was on the tab for all the damages and for rent and took him to court. They had to wait because apparently he made a fuss at the station and hit a cop. I don't know what happened after since we moved. So his life is probably still ruined and I couldn't care less. I bought mom another cross, me another stereo, and mom's boyfriend one too that wasn't as good as his old one but was still nice. I told him the full story over a bottle of tequila with his friends and had the best night I still don't remember much of. Take care of your mechanic friends. Well, now I know, if I live in an area where the cops don't really care and I have a mechanic nearby that can take apart my car, better not go and double cross them or be a jerk. Isn't it just sad though that both sides turning to the police because things were stolen and damaged and taken apart and the cops look at it and go, yeah, we don't have the resources for that. Just try uh, keeping an eye on it next time. Thanks guys, I really appreciate it. That makes me feel so much better and helps with my problem. They kicked my friend's mom out, so we trashed their store and got it shut down. 
Okay, I realize this may sound terrible, but you have to read through the whole story. This happened about 15 years ago when I was living overseas. Now I'm in the US. Let's just say I used to live in a developing country back at the time. Me and my friend, let's call him Han, were driving around the city one night when he got a phone call from his older brother, let's call him Barry. The phone call from what I was able to comprehend was pretty intense. After Han hung up, he was pretty frustrated. He told me to drive over to the supermarket near his parents' house. I did. I asked Han what was wrong. He said it looks like Barry has gotten into a fight and that he needs our help. I told him let's go see what's going on. On our way to the supermarket, Han called a couple of our friends and told them to meet us there for extra support. I know how this may sound. It sounds like we're a bunch of gangbangers looking to go start some stuff. So before y'all start jumping into conclusions, let me give you some background. The community I used to live in is heavily tribal. It's not about ganging up, but more like standing up and being there for a friend in need. That's the common mindset, and that's their way of life. It's pretty backwards at this day and age, and it's worth pointing out that I'm completely against that mindset now, especially that I'm living in the US. But anyway, we eventually arrived at that supermarket. It was in a very busy and vibrant area with lots of traffic. We parked our cars at the front door and stood out in the street waiting for Barry until he showed up. He was enraged, but yet calm and on point. We asked him what was going on, so he went on explaining. Apparently, Barry and Han's mom went into the supermarket to buy some chicken. She did manage to buy some, chicken in a sealed container. She needed it to cook for the day. But when she got home and opened the container, the chicken smelled absolutely rotten and disgusting. Understandably, she decided to go back to the store and return that chicken, notify the store management and get another chicken that isn't salmonella in a box, since she shops there quite often. I know my friend's mom, she's not a Karen in any way, and she's the super sweet lady in her 60s who's very friendly with everyone she meets. When she went into the store, found the store manager, told him about the rotten chicken and asked him politely to give her a different one, she was even discreet about it and didn't want other customers to hear. The manager was super rude and refused to acknowledge that there's anything wrong with the chicken outright, refused to exchange the chicken and wouldn't even smell or look at it. He called her a liar and told her to get the heck out of his store. Han, having learned that his mom was insulted that way, was pretty furious. Barry told us that he was going inside to talk to that manager and give him a piece of his mind, and that he wanted us to be there on standby in case things go down. We agreed and waited outside. Barry went in. We were looking at him through the glass door. We saw him speak to that manager with a clear understanding of how heated the conversation was getting. Basically, Barry asked the manager if he's the one who told his mom to get the heck out And the manager says, yes, and you get the freak out too, and shoves him away. Now a little background on Barry. He was feared. He's always been kind of problematic since he was little. He was never a bully, but he just never took crap from anybody ever. Now, while I don't agree with the way he handled things, I've always respected how he stands up for himself and for the people he cares about. It's worth mentioning that he's a lot more calm now. Within seconds of him going into the store, and after hearing how belligerent that manager was, Barry lost control over his rage, and we see him start throwing punches at that manager. Other employees joined in on the fight too, and all heck broke loose. Me, Han, and another friend of ours immediately jumped into the store. We started to trade punches with whoever was fighting. It was an utter cluster truck. All I remember was that I punched the manager a few times, and then I was on the ground. I didn't get punched or anything, and still have no idea how I ended up on the ground. Luckily, no one got, really, injured from either side. But we had a clear advantage over them. The aftermath was horrific. Glass was broken, shells were knocked down, and product stands were destroyed. I still remember M&Ms scattered all over the floor. It was a hot mess. At that time, we knew we were absolutely screwed. We pretty much vandalized a whole darn store and physically assaulted its staff. Eventually, we left and stood in front of the store and started cussing them out. They stayed inside the store because they knew that the law would be on their side while they are on their property. 
So about the laws in that country, they make absolutely no freaking sense whatsoever. A good example of its ridiculous laws is if you get physically assaulted by someone and you decide you want to press charges and you do just that, you'll need to go get a doctor's note stating your injury and then head to a police station and press charges. The person who assaulted you gets a phone call from the police telling them to come to the police station. That person can also press charges the same way, even if they're not at all injured. If both parties have pressed charges, both parties will go to jail awaiting trial unless bailed out. It's also worth mentioning that obtaining a forged doctor's note in that country is easier than buying a tub of sour cream. Fact. That said, we knew we better hurry up and press charges. We got to the police station before the supermarket staff and filed a complaint against them. They eventually arrived like 15 minutes later to do the same thing. It was the jerk manager and another guy that was in the fight too. At the police station, it was a shock to me how nicely we were being treated by officers and how crappy they treated the supermarket staff. Like, what the freak is going on? Shouldn't we be in handcuffs right now? What I didn't know was this. While we were standing out the door cussing those guys out after the fight, Barry disappeared. He did meet us at the police station, but we didn't know what he was doing after the fight was over. Well, it turns out that while Barry was exiting the store after the fight, he started yelling, My name is Barry so-and-so, and I'm not done freaking you up. Apparently a passing by police patrol heard Barry yell at the top of his lungs and stopped to see what was going on. Out of sheer coincidence, one of the patrolling officers turned out to be a distant cousin of Barry. It's a small country, and he recognized his name while he was shouting it. He took Barry aside for a word and started asking him what was going on. Barry explained the entire story of how they insulted his mom after selling her bad chicken and refusing to admit any wrongdoing. The officer also turned out to be an on-duty health and safety inspector. He then took it personal and assured Barry that he'll take care of it. Anyway, back to the police station. Now that both parties have pressed charges, the police were clearly favoring us. They threw the supermarket staff in a cell while we were sitting on the couch sipping coffee. Barry was still cussing the manager out. Eventually, we reached an agreement to drop all charges and we all went our way. Now the real revenge after the store was picked up and everything went back to normal, kinda, Barry's officer cousin went to the supermarket on an inspection the next day. Do you see where this is going? Yep. He found tons and tons of badly stored meat of all kinds that was completely inedible and could potentially be life-threatening. He also found spoiled dairy and a buttload of expired items. Apparently, the owner orders the staff to unplug the fridges and freezers at night to save on electricity. The owner was knowingly selling rotting meat to save a few bucks. The store was immediately shut down pending investigation. The health ministry got involved and fined the supermarket and the fine was just so huge that the store stayed shut down and never opened again because the owners weren't able to financially recover. Considering the end result, finding out that all that food was expired, they turned off the fridges and freezers at night, do you think getting in that fight and all the precursors to that health inspection made the entire thing worth it to save people? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. And our final story of the day is by Gustavo the Recliner, was told this belonged here. Which tries to destroy my orchard, I destroy her life. Well, let's start a few years in the past. My great-grandparents planted an orchard, it's now at least 120 years old. My grandparents and my parents were really proud of the peach trees growing in it and did their best to keep them in good health and well. We always threw a big party when the peaches were ready to be harvested and invited all of our friends and neighbors to it. I loved those parties. The neighbors on the property to the south of our orchard were particularly fond of our peaches. They were a bunch of fine old people, and me and the old man Sam were pretty good friends. He taught me a lot about woodworking with hand tools only, and we had some great evenings in his workshop, and we finished many a good whiskey in there together. In return, he got a lot of fine peaches, marmalade, homemade peach liquor, etc. Sadly, he died a good 10 years ago. Cancer's a real jerk. His wife followed soon after. Many suspected it was of a broken heart. They had no kids, so all of their property was left to the state, except his tools and whiskey collection, 
which he had gifted me a few weeks before he died. In comes Karen. The name speaks for itself. Haircut, attitude, witchiness, the whole deal. She bought the property of my late neighbors. We hadn't had the kind of money to buy it at that time, as we'd met some dire straits the years before, and all of our savings were gone. The first thing she did before she actually moved in was to go around and make demands of the neighbors on the surrounding properties. When it was finally our turn to listen to her gibberish, she told us that we needed to remove half of the trees, as the leaves were blowing on our property. We told her in a polite way that we won't comply to her demands as the orchard is a vital part of our family heritage, tradition, and life, and has been there for at least 120 years. She was pretty pissed, but did nothing for the time being. There's some things you need to know before I continue with this story. The workshop I mentioned before was situated right at the border to our property. It was a small, timber-framed building, at least 160 to 180 years old. The regulations in my state are pretty strict concerning old structures. Every structure over 100 years is protected, and you need a special permission to tear it down. Failing to get this permission can lead to a hefty fine. To get the permission to build a new building, it has to be up to code. And you have to ask your surrounding neighbors, and if they agree, you're good to go. Except, there's one specialty in my county. You have to keep a certain distance to the border of the property to allow emergency services full access to your property. If one of these requirements isn't met, the building is illegal, or at least only partially legal, and can actually be ordered by court to be torn down. That might come in handy later. So back to Karen. After our first encounter with her, she did her best to pester the whole neighborhood. She got the neighbor's dog put down because he allegedly attacked her brat. Later turned out she faked the attack. The dog was the sweetest and most innocent dog you could imagine. A Bernese mountain dog, big, but a real teddy bear. Anyways, she later got us to stop doing our annual peach parties as she called the police every time for various reasons. Noise complaints, we had a band playing there in the afternoon, arson. We lit a fire in a designated fire pit in the middle of our property. She called the ATF on us, allegedly making moonshine. My dad had a license to de-still for our own consummation. In short, she was a real pain in the bum bum, and after three years, we decided it wasn't worth it to deal with the various officers and law enforcement agencies every time we threw the party and we decided to quit. After she had reached this goal, she resorted to pestering us to remove the orchard. We didn't cave in, and some things started to get really fishy. Somehow the tires of our trucks got slashed, eggs got thrown on our farmhouse, our cat disappeared and surfaced a few days later in pretty rough condition. It looked like somebody had tried to cut his tail off. Don't worry, he healed up completely, but we actually couldn't prove that she did all that. Then came the day she made her biggest mistake. She had a company come in, in sort of a secret operation, and tear down the old woodworking workshop overnight. Two days later, they started building a big garage slash recreational center slash house right where the shop was. But she missed one fine detail which got pretty important later on, she didn't ask for our permission, nor for the neighbors. A short while after, the trees right next to our property started to get sick. The leaves turned brown in the middle of summer, and the branches started to die. We lost four trees before we figured out the cause. Somebody had driven long copper nails into them. We had a suspicion, but we couldn't prove it. So we put up some trail cameras perfectly legal as it was on our own property. We caught her red-handed. My dad confronted her. She apologized, and my dad, being the way-too-nice guy he is, wanted to let her get off the hook. But not me. The nail she drove into our oldest tree was the final nail to her coffin. I started to investigate. I had some friends at the administration of our county and asked them to do some inquiries. Turned out she hadn't applied for permission to tear down the old shop, nor for permission to build a new building. I further did some inquiries on the borderline of our property. Turned out, the old markers vanished over time, and her building was about three feet on our property. After I gathered all this information, I presented it to my parents. At first, they were reluctant, as they didn't want to start a neighborhood clash. But after I recalled all the things she did to us and our neighbors, they were in. So let the games begin. 
First, we called the authorities on her for tearing down a protected building and presented them with all the evidence we gathered. Then, we called the building authorities on her for building a building without permission, not up to code, and not only didn't she keep the required distance to the property border, she also built on our property without our permission. Long story short, turned out the workshop hasn't only been protected because of its age, but also because it was a historical landmark, which played a vital role in a conflict back in the 1860s. She got sued for this and had to pay a fine of an equivalent of about $150,000. She further had to demolish her newly built building, costing an additional $50,000, got fined for this too, about $83,000, and had to rebuild the workshop on her own expense which was another whopping $154,000, as it had to be period correct up to the smallest detail, meaning it had to be built with the correct materials, with hand tools only, and to the correct dimensions. As you can imagine, paying professionals to build quite a large timber-framed building only by hand gets pretty expensive pretty fast. So all in all, it cost her an equivalent of $437,000 plus further expenses as lawyers, etc. This caused her to go bankrupt, so she had to sell the property in the end, which my parents bought, by the way. Last I heard of her was that she moved back to the big city. I'm sorry, but if you're going to move out somewhere more rural, a place that's a lot more discreet, a place with trees nearby, you should kind of expect that leaves are going to be blowing into your yard. This was one of those mega witch neighbors that nobody wants to live near. If you live next to them and they can have a say or try to stop you from doing anything, they're going to try to do so. Unless you're silent, your leaves don't blow into their yard, and you just let them do whatever they want, they're going to try to make your life as miserable as possible. And just because of the dog thing, I hope this lady, wherever she moved, struggled and couldn't find a home. Grandma gets revenge on neighborhood teenage creep. This is my grandma's story that she loves to tell at family gatherings, and it's always a good laugh. This happened when she was also a teenager, takes place in the 1970s. My grandma used to live in this neighborhood that had a community pool. Her and all the other kids in the neighborhood visited the pool on a daily basis during the summer. There was one boy, I'll call him Creep, who was notorious for his swimming speed and removing girls' bikini tops. Basically, Creep would sneak up on a girl underwater, untie the bikini top, causing the girl to be exposed and swim away before anyone could really catch him, my grandma included. Of course, the lifeguard on duty was notified, and the lifeguard directly spoke to Creep's parents multiple times. But they never did anything about Creep and always brushed it off. I'm assuming the lifeguard couldn't stop Creep from showing up to the pool or something like that since it was a repeated offense. Since nothing was done about Creep, my grandma decided to take her revenge into her own hands. My grandma's nails were, and still are, very strong and healthy. One night, she sat in her bedroom and carefully filed all of her nails to a sharp point. The next day, everyone was at the pool as usual. My grandma was in the water and strolling around. She purposely held her hands above the water so her nails remained hard and dry and awaited. Sure enough, Creep saw a back turn to him and thought this was another target for his creepy prank. He swam up to her underwater, unknowing that my grandmother was watching him from the corner of her eye. And when her bikini top fell down, she lunged after Creep while he was just about to swim away and raked all of her claws down Creep's wet and soft back. Creep screamed as blood began spreading in the water around them. He scrambled to the pool edge and was frantically trying to get out of the water, and according to my grandma, she said it looked like he was attacked by a wild cat, to which my family jokingly says he was. Everyone in the pool had to evacuate for obvious reasons. Either later that day or the next day, Creep's parents stormed to the pool and wail about pressing charges against my grandma. The lifeguard simply responded with a reminder about Creep's behavior and warned that he would also go to the police to be a witness. My great-grandmother was also there and threatened with a lawsuit of sexual harassment against Creep's parents. Needless to say, Creep never returned to the pool after that. My grandma says she feels bad about probably permanently scarring Creep, but 
that's about it. Do you think that, considering the creep's actions, that the grandma should feel guilty about what they did? Or do you think the creep deserved every ounce of what they got? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Our next story is by Gustafsson, a co-worker stolen other people's lunch boxes and almost dies. Post year 2008 subprime crisis. Situation, third world country, the IT sector was very affected after the subprime crisis. I got a job as a developer in a place with horrible rules, treatment of staff, and very ugly workplace in general, and on top of that allowed smoking inside the offices without ventilation. But I had to pay the bills. The pay was so bad that it was normal for many people to do small thefts, like papers, pens, notebooks, etc. But one thing they warned me when I came in was that I should never leave anything to eat in the fridge because someone else was going to eat it. There were a couple of booby traps with soft drinks with laxatives or similar, but as I found out later, someone left a lunchbox with food, seeing that the food was poisoned with rat poison. Someone ate that food, and it turns out that already had rat poison. This woman had almost died from internal bleeding and ended up with serious long-term damages in her digestive system, destroyed kidneys, and compromised liver. How did I find out? When the police came and questioned us all in a brutal way. I was cleared, but it was not pleasant. And they never, as far as I know, found the culprit. A month or two later, I found a better job. I didn't pay more but it was better. I mean, yeah, I think that probably just about takes the cake for one of the worst workplaces I've heard of. You know, you hear these lunch thief stories and sometimes you hear them where someone goes and puts dog food in their lunch and the person still goes and eats it. Or they make a cat food tuna sandwich or something. Isn't too often you hear the story about the rat poison. This next story is by X Dankest XX Meme X. Steal my stuff. I'll ruin your life. Okay, so for a little backstory, I've lived in the same small town all my life, I'm 16, and I have a lot of good and bad memories. A lot of good stories too, but I'll save those for another day. So you could say I had or am having a rough childhood, you know, bullied in school, poverty, parents constantly fighting, homeless for a while, got jumped a few times, and even got shot once. But the worst of them all is when my mom passed away from pneumonia in her lungs last year. I was 15. I would do anything to have her back. Me and her were very, very close. So all this stuff that's happened to me happened for a reason. Because I can tell you I'm not no punk. Even if I don't win a fight or even get the life beaten out of me, which has happened, I will take it like a man. So everyone that knows me knows I don't take no kind of stuff. I'm also very clever and smart so I can pull some slick stuff sometimes. Okay, so this happened not too long ago, probably three to four months ago. So I'm pretty chill, so I don't really care who comes over to my house as long as you're chill too. No one has ever stolen anything from me or my house, and everyone was cool with me because I'm a pretty funny, chill, and nice guy. Until one day, this kid came around, we'll call him Mac. So Mac is new in town and doesn't know much, but he moved in the house down the street. And I guess he noticed all the people coming over, or he smelt the weed. So he came knocking, and I answered, and he seemed pretty cool, so I let him in. We chilled, played some Xbox, and smoked for a few hours, until Mac decides he wants to go home. So of course my high self didn't notice anything went missing until my best friend asked if he could hit my vape. I say sure, go grab it. And sure enough, it was freaking gone. And I knew it was Mac because everyone else in the house I've known since elementary or was family. And I trusted them with my life. I also have really bad OCD so I know where I put my stuff. But before I start to run down to his house, I check around to see if anything else was missing. Turns out he somehow managed to steal both my vapes, my pack of cigarettes, a lot of my weed, and my phone, which I give him props for because neither did me or my three other friends notice it happened. So I practically flew out the front door. I don't even know if I touched the yard. I think I cleared the witch, but all I know is I ran fast to his house. I only knew where he lived because I saw him moving in while I was riding around on my bike. His house was only a block or two away, but I felt like I teleported there. I banged on his door like a freaking cop, and of course, there was no answer, so I couldn't really do much. I wasn't going to call the cops. What am I supposed to tell them? He stole my weed and cigarettes? No, I'm 16, and I'm not kicking down the door because that's just dumb. So I just walked home and started thinking of a brilliant plan. 
So it's the next day, and I walked down to his crib and knocked on the door. He answered, and I kid you not, he looked like he was gonna poop himself. But he didn't say anything, and neither did I. I pretended like nothing happened. I asked him if he wanted to come over and chill, and he kinda hesitated, but he took the bait. So my friends and I already had a plan, and we all had our own parts. So first of all, we got him stoned as freak. I ordered an ounce of moon rocks, which cost me a pretty penny, but it was completely worth it. So we chilled again and played more Xbox almost all day, but made sure Mac kept hitting the bong until he could barely stay awake. He actually managed to smoke about 11 or so grams by himself. I only smoked like 3 grams though cause I didn't want to be too high for my plan. Mac kept falling asleep for little naps then waking back up to smoke more. So my friends did little small pranks like cut chunks of hair off and draw wieners and stuff on his face. He actually woke up while I was drawing a certain former German symbol on him but he was so stoned he didn't give a freak. So I asked him if he wants a beer. He said yes, so I go into the kitchen, grabbed a Bud Light, opened it, and poured a decent amount of dish soap in it. You'll see why I did this later. I hand him the beer and he just completely ignored the fact that it was already opened and downed it. I did this a few times too. Our next move was to get Mac in public, which was freaking hard. His fat butt didn't want to go anywhere because he was pretty messed up. We weren't though, we just pretended like we were so he didn't suspect anything. It literally took us like 10 to 20 minutes to convince him to come with us to town to show him around. We took him to the local Walmart in town, and we started playing Truth or Dare, which was a part of the plan. We dared him to go in and steal a candy bar. Now remember, he's drunk and high off his butt. He has stuff all over his face and his hair's completely messed up. He looked like a freaking crackhead. Max said yes without even thinking, but what he didn't know was that our buddy was working there at the time and we told him to bust Mac. I kinda wish that the plan worked, but apparently he didn't even make it to the candy. All I heard was that he just passed the freak out and pooped himself, dish soap. He was arrested for all kinds of stuff. I even heard he pooped on one of the officers. But I really don't know to be honest, we took the freak off the second he went into Walmart. He tried to stick it to us, but no one believed in Mac. The cops did come over, but we were little angels and didn't know anything. Till this day, I don't know where Mac is, I really don't care, he could still be in jail for all I care. I never got my stuff back, but I really don't care. I actually ended up mowing Mac's parents' yard for some money and bought a new phone and a bad-to-the-bone vape with the money I got from them. Well, if there's anything that I gathered from this story, I learned a new use for dish soap. And to be fair, I assume Mac going into that house and being around them knew kind of what the deal was. Like they were in there and they were around these people for long enough to know that if you mess with these people, you're probably going to get a pretty harsh revenge. And they messed around and found out. And our final story of the day is by Chocoholic. Don't mess with the F slur. I'm an athletic gay guy and always have been. I was also born and raised in Texas. So you can imagine some of the goings on in my younger years when being homosexual was less accepted. This was a little over 10 years ago. Freshman year, I'm on the basketball team. I'm not good, not great, just average. The team also takes up a class period and some days we have to study instead of practice. One of the kids on the team, M, would constantly give me crap for being gay, calling me an F word, a Q word, all of the usual slurs. I, always being a pretty amiable guy and extremely slow to action, accepted his insults with open arms. Although I wasn't the star player among the people who knew me, I made sure my nickname was The F Slur. I'd answer yes to every does butt taste good or do you have a body count? I never let it show, but this constant disrespect towards me and other people, including teachers, really got to me. He would harass my friends, pick on the boys, catcall and make lewd comments to the girls. He was the kind of kid to do a fake yes sir to a teacher who was getting on to him about something. That's when a little birdie told me his dad had died three years ago and his mom was an alcoholic. Despite the fact that I now had this knowledge, I held on to it until I had my chance. M liked to shove people around, but he never did me because I was pretty popular and matched him physically. Like I said, that didn't stop him from picking on people close to me. I started preparing for the fight I knew would come. Working bags, learning footing, all the good stuff. After three months of preparation, I felt ready. He came upon me in the bathroom. Talked some smack, I don't remember. There were a few of his buddies. 
perfect. Remember how I said his dad had died? I said, okay, daddy issues. Can I call you that? Is not having one really considered a daddy issue? By the way, why are you so fixated on gay sex? Why do you ask so many questions? Do you want to try it? Or was the last thing your dad teach you was how to suck, you know what? Admittedly, not the best as I type it out, but mean enough. This got him enraged, all the better. He charged at me through the narrow part of the bathroom. My back was to the wall, and he was moving too fast. I got out of the way, and he harmlessly flung himself against the wall. Harmlessly for him and me. Well, not for long. He had to shift his weight. I, to his side, had already done so. It was a one-punch KO to the side of the jaw. This kid had never been in a real fight before. It only took me raising a middle finger at the next three friends he had brought with him to make them reconsider their dedication to the mission at hand. Next, I kicked him in the face while he was down four times. My shoes were smeared with blood. I kicked him in the balls a fair few times after that, spat him to the back of his head, and walked away. I never talked to him again. I never cared how he was doing today. But I'd seen his face, and it certainly wasn't the one he'd been born with. Naturally, word of the fight spread around. I got in some big trouble, suspension. But the motto, don't mess with the F slur, spread around real quick. As far as I know, nobody ever did. Yeah, I mean, all these bullies think they're high and mighty, until somebody who can actually defend themselves is in that position. I'm gonna go out on a limb and assume that they thought that because OP was gay, that somehow they'd be weak or inferior or couldn't do well in a fight. I mean, let alone the fact that they brought four people to go up against one OP. Considering everything OP had to go through growing up in Texas, taking all these rude remarks in stride as well as they could, and then dropping that right hook, it must have been just so satisfying to deliver that punch and defend yourself like that. I'm sure that's a lesson that that kid will never forget. And honestly, considering all that happened, I'm surprised OP didn't get more punishment, but I think that just makes it all worth it. Parking spot stealing douche waffle gets his Lexus set on fire. While not as nuclear as some stories I've read, proportionate to the crime I'd say this counts, sent the Wayback Machine to the year 2000. I'm living in a crappy apartment over a storefront, so parking was limited. Now, this was the middle of winter, and I didn't have a car at that period in my life, but my girlfriend at the time did. She was coming over in a couple hours, and finding parking on the street is a gamble, so I wanted to dig out a parking spot for her out of the snowbank in the alley behind my building. I didn't own a snow shovel, so using a hammer, old plastic ice cream bucket, and my bare hands, I dug out a chunk about 3 meters by 2 meters by 2 meters to make room for her to park. I don't know if you can appreciate how much snow that is, but it was a lot of work. Especially considering my lack of proper equipment, this isn't fresh fallen snow either. This is a snowbank packed by a plow, practically ice. But whatever, we do crazy things for love, right? But apparently I'd had too much faith in humanity. I thought the cardboard sign I left in the newly cleared parking spot that said, I spent an hour and a half digging this out for someone specific, please do not park here, would be enough. Nope. Wouldn't be riding this if it had been. Naturally, some thunder runt of a Lexus owner threw the sign in a dumpster and stole the spot. I remember it was red. I was going to post a link to a pic of the car that resembles it, but it's kind of irrelevant anyway. I hadn't told my girlfriend about my plan to dig out the parking spot, mostly because I didn't want to look like a wuss if it was too much work and I gave up. So I just stewed on it, imagining all the things I could do. My girlfriend ended up finding a spot on the street a block away, and we had a good evening anyway. She had to work the next day, so she took off around 2am, and I stayed up until maybe around 4am. The car was still there, and I was still pissed. By this time, all the bars were closed, the neighbors were asleep, and the streets were quiet. Couldn't ask for a better opportunity to ruin someone's crap. I went outside with a bottle of anhydrous isopropanol I kept around as a solvent, doused the car's tires, and set them on fire. I nabbed the cardboard sign from the dumpster and used it to quickly scrape the snow and cover my tracks, and then took it inside with me. No point leaving evidence behind. Over the course of the next few minutes, I heard bang, kapow, blam, boom as the tires burst one by one. I had honestly expected the whole car to go up in flames, but each burst was apparently forceful enough 
to put out each individual tire, as well as blast out a sizable divot in the snowpack. Nothing happened until the next day, but police were eventually called. They were knocking on doors, asking if anyone saw something. Nope, sorry, must have slept right through it. Good luck, officer. Hope you catch the guy. I turned on my police scanner to keep tabs on things, mostly out of fear of getting caught, but there were no witnesses, and I learned the owner only had liability insurance. What kind of idiot buys a Lexus but not full coverage? I would soon find out. When I went outside to survey my handiwork under the guise of taking out the trash and being a curious resident, oh man, yeah, that guy was gonna need to get his whole car resprayed. The car looked fine structurally, but I did probably more than two grand worth of cosmetic damage, not to mention needing four new tires. I also got a look at the guy who owned the car, and the image I created in my head of what a person would look like that would so unapologetically steal someone's hard work was completely accurate. He was a grade A first class board certified textbook D-bag. Orange fake tan, way too much hair product, leather pants, weapons grade douchery. A decade before Jersey Shore was a thing, I regret nothing. Never saw that car again. Got away scot-free. Be honest, if it was snowing harshly and there were no parking spaces around whatsoever, you see one perfectly shoveled out parking space but it has this sign saying, I shoveled this out, please don't park here. Would you ignore the sign and park there anyway? Or would you try and find a spot blocks away that's just a lot less convenient? Let me know about you guys in the comments down below. Our next story is by Rumpelforskin990. Scumbag does $2,000 damage to my car, steals my best friend's motorcycle while recovering from dental surgery, gets whole life destroyed for years. This happened several years ago, but first, let's meet the cast. There's me, best friend, and of course, the star of the show, Scumbag. First, a little bit of background. There was this homeless he wasn't truly homeless, scumbag, who I was sheltering in my house while he looked for a place to stay. I wanted to help him out and help him get back on his feet. He'd been problematic for a while. He was pooing in the trash can, peeing in soda bottles everywhere, and lying to everyone all the time. He wasn't even good at lying. He was one of those pathological liars who can't tell the truth to save their life. And when he got a BB gun, he shot out my neighbor's window. This will become relevant at the end. The list of sketchy stuff Scumbag did could go on for days, but that's not what I'm writing this about, though it certainly does factor into the revenge. Now on to the main event. While one of my buddies needed a ride to the train station and I was too tired to drive, I let him take my car and drive him to the train station. When he came back, my front bumper was on the ground and he duct taped it back on. He claimed he was T-boned at an intersection and injured his leg. He went to the hospital, faked his injury, and came back with crutches so I'd buy it. When I asked the police in the town he said it happened in, whom he said he had filed a report with, they told me no such event had been reported and they had no clue what I was talking about. I later found out through my buddy who was in the car with him that he was doing donuts in a parking lot and hit a tree. So shame on me for letting someone drive my car, I know. It was a very stupid decision on my part. The cost of repairing my car came out to be $2,000 and I couldn't get insurance to cover it so the repairs came out of my pocket. So I gave him the benefit of the opportunity to make things right and said, all right, pay for the cost of repairs and I'll forgive the transgression. He already had a minimum wage job, so I expected him to pay me every week until it was paid off. After two weeks, he stopped, so I took his PS3 and safe as collateral and said I'd give it back when he paid me back, and if he didn't, I'd sell it to cover the costs. A few weeks later, my best friend who was also staying with me had his wisdom teeth removed. He was in a ton of pain. That dental pain is the worst. Scumbag said he needed to go to the store. He let Scumbag take the bike to the grocery store, but after a while we became suspicious. He called saying the bike wouldn't start. I drove over to the store he said he was at, and he and the motorcycle were nowhere to be found. The store was 10 minutes away. We called him and said bring it back now, or else we'll report it stolen. When he came back later that evening with a girl, he made up a BS excuse as to why the motorcycle had 130 miles on the odometer. 
The way he told it made it clear he had no clue how mechanical odometers work. They don't glitch and jump ahead 130 miles, like he said it did. My best friend would know, he's constantly pulling his bike apart and making repairs and modifications to it. I grilled him about the fact that he was never where he said he was. We deduced that he had rode the bike to his hometown to pick up his girlfriend and back and lied about everything. That was the last straw that broke the camel's back and a very bad mistake. My best friend and I were trembling with rage when we threw him and his girl out the front door to the curb. This is where the nuclear revenge begins. Scumbag was dumb enough to leave all of his passwords saved on the laptop we loaned him while he was with us. We got his email and changed the password. Once you've got someone's email, you've got everything else by default. We got his social media accounts and financial accounts and reset their passwords too. It was hysterical seeing the flurry of password reset emails coming in. He knew we had him in the bag and was frantically trying to salvage his situation. He had opened a bank account at the local bank to deposit his paychecks from his local cashier job while he was in the area. We emptied the whole thing for a total of $2,500. Imagine my shock. I kept the $2,000 from my car and gave the remaining $500 to best friend for his troubles and having my back. We then sold his PS3 on Craigslist and split that 50-50. We eventually opened his safe and it was full of random papers and earbuds of no value. But it did have his debit card and one of the papers had his pin on it, which is how we emptied his bank account. In addition to that, while he's on the way out, I go to the store he was working at and tell his boss he won't be showing up this afternoon and to consider him to be quit. I explained why. The manager was cool about it, but told me he can't take my word for it. In any event, he was never seen at that establishment again. So sooner or later, that manager was going to have to take my word for it. But we're not done yet. We still have a social life to destroy. We hijack his Facebook and make all of his friends hate him. We make posts about crappy stuff he did. We make posts about eating his poop. We make posts exclaiming his love of all manners of debauchery and degeneracy. We start petty fights with his friends list in the DMs. We go under their walls and say snarky, nasty crap. We turned everyone against him. And in the process of destroying his social life, a bunch of girls he abused and who lurked on his page came out of the woodwork praising us for taking him down a peg. It's been years and he still doesn't have a social media presence. A few weeks go by and we get a package in the mail from him. Turns out he wasn't homeless and completely out of options like he said. Big surprise, I know. The package was mailed from his parents' house. It's an empty threat to sue me overflowing with hilariously made up lies and pages of screenshots of what we did to his social media. Me and best friend are laughing our butts off reading it. He said he left town because the bills were too much. He never did sue us and we even taunted his bluff with our new Facebook account. The reason why he thought this would fly is the neighbor threatened to sue us over the window he broke and we paid for the replacement window. So he thought that the mere threat of a lawsuit would be enough to put an end to the revenge. I still have his lawsuit letter because I like to read it for a good chuckle every now and then. I'm thinking of framing it on my wall as a trophy. Last I heard, he's completely destitute and has zero friends now that everyone knows how much of a terrible person he is. Even his parents got sick of his manipulative behavior. His girlfriend didn't take long to wise up and apologize to us. So what's the real lesson of the story? Protect the ever-loving crap out of your email because that's all anyone needs to gain access to everything else you do and completely ruin you. Also, don't save your passwords on the computers of the people you're screwing over. I mean, I have to agree, you do want to protect your email because that's kind of a central hub if you use that same email for everything. Social medias, bank accounts, credit monitoring, even potentially lower stuff like Amazon, fast food, Play Store, or iCloud. There's a lot of damage that somebody can do with your email. I'm definitely not going to say what OP did here was right because there was a lot done to this guy, but the guy was a lying, stealing jerk, so how sorry could you really feel for him? And our final story of the day is by Drumhead. Entitled Lady's Porsche Loses Tires Okay, so this story took place back when I was in Florida in the early 90s. It does involve an act of vandalism that's connected to revenge. Hopefully it won't be removed and hopefully it'll count as nuclear revenge. Anyway, South Florida was devastated by Hurricane Andrew. My dad was part of a local charity 
that was set up day after day at a local market seeking donations from shoppers to give to food banks. You have to understand, this storm left many people homeless and without power, in some cases for 6 plus months, in Florida heat and humidity. My father was legally disabled from a serious car accident. He was hit by a drunk driver in the early 80s and suffered from relentless hip and back problems. It never killed his heart or kindness to others, hence the charity work. One day, he was about to pull into the disabled space at the local market to go buy a few items to donate to the hurricane charity. Right before he's about to pull in, this lady pulls into the space in this shiny red Porsche. My dad parks behind her and says, excuse me ma'am, I was about to pull in there, and also points to his disabled placard in the window. She says to him, pfft, you don't look disabled, and proceeded to walk into the store. For anyone who has a relative who uses a disabled space, you know the frustration of this situation and the anger one feels. My dad, seemingly unfazed, waits until she goes into the store and then gets out and snips the valve stems on all four tires, flattening but not destroying all of them. He then pulls into another space not far away and just waits. About 15 minutes later, the lady comes out and is shrieking about her car being vandalized. My dad's far enough away so she can't see him, but he can hear everything. She calls the police. Big mistake. She files a report for vandalism, and the police give her a ticket for being parked in the disabled space with no placard, about $250 at the time. The cops leave and she calls a tow truck. As the car's being loaded onto the truck, my dad pulls up and says to her, You don't look disabled, but your car sure is, and then drives off. My dad could be a nice guy and pure savage when he needed to be. I don't necessarily approve of what OP's dad did here, but I mean, come on. Somebody in a shiny red Porsche parking in the disabled spot, when obviously they don't have any disability, it makes it kind of want to cheer for the outcome here because they're just a total jerk. The least toxic thing you could do would be to hit the like and subscribe buttons down below. To be honest, I have no idea what subcategory to write this story because it has a bit of everything. Entitled parents, entitled people, nuclear revenge, and fair warning, this story stretches out over a period of more than a decade so it's going to be a long one. So first, some backstory. I came from your average nuclear family. I had a mom and a dad who hated each other and seemed to spend their whole marriage talking about divorce, an older sister whom I didn't get along with, but as time went on would not only become my best friend, but also kind of my hero, and me, the youngest, 14 years old when this all started. Very relevant to the story, my dad, until losing his job only a few months ago, worked overseas most of my life and was only home 5 months of the year. So our tale begins with my mother succumbing from her long battle with cancer. She'd been hospitalized for quite some time and, I'll admit, those last few months I had given up completely. I had hardly gone to see her. I just could not bring myself to see her rotting away in that hospital bed. My dad hadn't been much better than me and the hero of the story had been my sister, the one who had never gotten along with my mother, who held her hand until the very end. None of this is vital to the story, but it was the point where my sister not only won my respect, but also became the one person whom I would grow to trust than any other. My dad, not so much. In fact, his life had hardly changed at all, and my mom's ashes had hardly been released, and he was overseas again, leaving me and my sister behind. Also worth mentioning at this time, my sister was no longer living at home, but was living with her fiancé. He later cheated on her, she broke the engagement, and he will therefore not feature in the story. So all the pieces are set in place. My mom's past, my dad's overseas, and my sister's living elsewhere. Leaving me, a 14-year-old kid living alone in what, until recently, was our family home. Soon after, I got a tenant to take one of the rooms, and that rent money paid for all my living expenses. Now, as I mentioned, my dad was out of the country only seven months of the year, which meant he was home for five of them, or so you'd expect. The truth is, he wasn't. My dad was a skirt chaser, and even in those five months I hardly ever saw him, as he'd be out staying with whatever he was hooking up with at the time. I could write about a thousand more stories about the woman he dated in that time, but as none of them have relevance to this story, I'm skipping forward four years in the introduction to evil stepmother. It's worth mentioning that when she and dad started dating, he was actually already engaged to someone else, whom kinda 
just disappeared from the story, as if she was never in his life to begin with. Evil stepmother was the wife of a deceased politician. I've never been able to figure out how much exactly he left her, but my estimate is somewhere between 15 and 20 million. Although neither my sister and I had any interest in money, her financial status was something of a relief, as my dad was pretty well off himself, so at the very least, we knew she wasn't a gold digger. So actually, when I first met her, she was lovely, polite, a good sense of humor, overall just a nice person to be around. And I was truly happy that my dad had finally found somebody who could make him happy. Skip forward another year, my sister was now engaged to a new guy and was starting to plan her wedding. My sister, being the angel that she is, even with a multi-millionaire father, never asked him to contribute a single penny to the wedding. What did she ask him? For him and evil stepmother to attend. He was her dad after all. Please note, even though I'm calling her evil stepmother, she wasn't officially our stepmother yet at this point. She had given the date to evil stepmother, who had kind of brushed it off and said they would try to attend, but they couldn't make any promises because it might interfere with their holiday plans. My sister was understandably distraught, and ultimately just called off the wedding and would end up taking their vows in front of a judge. So a few weeks after evil stepmother had broken my sister's heart, she and my dad were traveling to god knows where, and my sister and I were at the movies. We both get the same text from evil stepmother. It went something like this. Hello, I want you to be the first to know that father has asked me to become his wife and I have accepted. I forget what the rest said. Cut forward to the day that my sister's wedding would have taken place, and we both get an invite to evil stepmother's house. My dad had long since moved in with her. I had a bad feeling about this, but thought to myself that no one can possibly be so unnecessarily cruel. But if people weren't, then I would not be writing this story. So you guessed it, evil stepmother had stolen my sister's wedding date and had married our dad that morning. The invite we had received was to their wedding reception. There's going to be a massive time jump now, but before I do, I just want to emphasize some of the highlights of my dad and evil stepmother's first marriage. Yes, you read that right. These included a house rule that strictly forbid me or my sister ever mentioning our deceased mother, me making the grave sin of turning 21. Please note, at no point did I ask my father to cut their vacation short to celebrate this with me, but he decided to come surprise me and come home a day earlier to do so. The next five years, and I'm not making that up, every single time evil stepmother saw me, she would berate me for how my birthday screwed up their vacation. Her and my dad showing up at the family house while I was at work, taking the family dogs and giving them away without so much as consulting me. To top it all off, she would constantly try and play my sister and me up against each other, always cornering one of us and telling us what a waste of space the other was. So skip forward about another year, I'd now been the landlord of the family house for about seven years. I was now renting out to several tenants and using that money to rent the house for my dad. The rest I used to upkeep the place as well as I possibly could. Basically, even though his name was still on the deed, it was pretty much accepted that the house was now mine and would officially become mine when my dad passes. The place was beyond sentimental to me. And then one afternoon, he shows up with a car full of things declaring that he's left evil stepmother and was moving back in with me. Oh joy. Following this, it took less than a month for all my tenants to break their contracts and move out. Yes, he was really that difficult to live with. The month ended and he went back overseas, leaving me with an empty house and somehow still expecting me to pay him for that month's rent. Sorry dad, you kinda screwed that up for yourself. He returned six weeks later and fell back into his old patterns, never coming home, hooking up with any woman that looked at him, and then, somehow, getting back together with the fiancé he had left for evil stepmother. His divorce from evil stepmother had already been finalized by this point. And then, almost as if I was 18 years old again, he once again left that same fiancé for evil stepmother. At some point they got remarried, I honestly don't remember when. So let's get to the main part of the story. 
Yes, I haven't even touched it yet. A secret about my dad, I love him dearly, but he's a freaking jerk. I would learn this the hard way, as I would become a pawn in his numerous affairs. He went so far as to send some of these women to stay in the family house with me, and then invite me over to have dinner with him and evil stepmother, forcing me to fake smile while the woman he was cheating with was literally hiding at my house. This went on for years. Both I and my sister knew about it. Both of us had begged him to stop, and he just did not give two hex. Wow, it's taking a lot out of me not to use curse words as I relive this period. Also during this period, my sister had given birth to a beautiful baby girl. Even though my dad and evil stepmother had already been having marital problems at that time, again, he had shown up with her to the hospital and introduced her as grandma. In the years that followed, this gorgeous little one would actually bring my sister and evil stepmother quite close together, which makes this all the more tragic. Flash forward several more years, I'm now 30 and going through a very tough time in my life. I had lost my own fiancé, in part due to my family shunning both of us and ultimately forcing me to choose between them and her. This basically happened every single time I got a girlfriend. My business had hit a streak of insanely bad luck and was hanging on by a thread. I had lost all my savings trying to save my beautiful dog from a rare blood disease. I had been falsely accused of assault. Basically, I was closer to ending things than I ever imagined possible. And to top all that off, my dad again left evil stepmother and once more moved back in with me. To make matters worse, he wasn't doing so alone. No, he brought with him his Asian mistress. A lady that could not speak a word of English and they were literally communicating with each other via Google Translate. The whole situation was pretty messed up. Just to keep the timeline straight, he had left her before going back to work overseas and had warned me beforehand that he would be moving back in with me upon his return. At no point did he mention his Asian mistress. Also slightly relevant, the day he came back was the 24th of December. At this time, evil stepmother was on the verge of her own mental breakdown and was calling my sister day and night trying to learn why my dad had left her. This went on for the entire time that my dad was overseas and continued when he came back. My sister was calling me in tears, saying she couldn't keep this secret anymore. She had grown fond of evil stepmother and knew the only way to release her was to tell her about the affairs. There had been eight that we know of. I, on the other hand, had never grown to like evil stepmother, but even I had always been disgusted by our father's behavior and never saw any justification in what he had been doing to her. Ultimately, I told my sister to just tell her. That would be the biggest mistake of my life. You see, learning of my dad's portrayal had given evil stepmother a new purpose in life. She wasn't only going to get revenge on my dad, she was going to get revenge on everyone that was involved. Her first mission was finding out who the woman was that was currently staying with him, and to find out, she turned to me. Now side note here, I had been so angry at my dad for this whole situation that I hadn't even been back to my house since he had moved back in. I had spent about three days, including Christmas, just driving around aimlessly. I had slept in my car for those nights. I was done being his accomplice. Therefore, when evil stepmother asked me who the woman was, I happily told her. There was just one problem with this. My dad had foreseen me turning on him and given me the wrong information. Therefore, in the eyes of evil stepmother, I had purposely sent her on a wild goose chase. Following this, my dad had sent me a message that I was no longer his son. The woman had actually been a masseuse at a massage parlor that both my dad and evil stepmother had often frequented, less than a kilometer away from their home. To this day, I don't know how evil stepmother found this out, but she showed up at the massage parlor and started screaming and threatening to sue. She also started following my dad's mistress around. What happened next, she refuses to admit was her doing, but a few days later, someone sent naked photos of my dad's mistress to her boss, and she was subsequently fired. My dad in the meantime had grown bored with her as well, and had started to rebuild his marriage with evil stepmother. This was unbeknownst to both me and my sister, and made even less sense when their second divorce finalized. 
My dad's mistress around this time also completely vanished off the face of the earth. Did I mention that evil stepmother liked to brag about the mob connections she had left from her deceased husband's time in politics? and had openly told us how they could make people just completely disappear. Cut forward a few months later, I hadn't seen my dad in months, and still had no idea that he and evil stepmother had gotten back together. I found this out when his Facebook relationship status changed to married to evil stepmother, followed by their wedding pictures. This was kind of a shock to me, but the biggest one was still to come. I was still in financial difficulty following my recent streak of bad luck. And then I got a text. I forget what the exact wording was, but it basically came down to the fact that evil stepmother had no longer felt comfortable living in their old place, knowing that he'd met his mistress so close to there. So he was taking back the family home, and I was going to have to evict all my tenants and move out myself. At that point, I'd been living in that house for 19 years, and had been the acting landlord for 16 of those. To add fuel to the fire, I also learned that evil stepmother was having the old house demolished and building a new place on top of it. I was shattered. That place had meant more to me than anything else in this world, and she was coming in with bulldozers to destroy it. To make up for my sudden eviction, they had, however, taken the liberty of already finding me a new place to live that they knew would be in my budget. They took me there a few days later. This place was terrifying. It was the kind of place where you'd get shot in the face if you left your home after dark. To make matters worse, they were right. It was literally the only place I could afford at that point, and on such short notice. Dad of the year and evil stepmother had left me to pack up the entire house, including everything left from my mother. The shoebox I was moving to obviously didn't have any space for any of these things, so most of it ended up on the sidewalk. To evil stepmother, this had been like a mini climax as she'd always had an unnatural hate towards my deceased mother, whom she had never met and had died before she met my father. She would go so far to destroy every single thing that held any memory of my mother, even cutting down our family tree and quite literally turning it into firewood, taking my mother's wedding ring that had been left to my sister to hold for safekeeping, only to quite literally throw it away and deny ever having it. That was her revenge on me. My sister, she had other plans for. You see, once my sister had exposed my father's affair to her, she had wasted no time in revealing to him that my sister had sold him out. My dad, being the self-entitled person that he is, still was unable to see that he had been in the wrong here, and basically had not spoken to my sister since. He had not only stopped speaking to her, but had also stopped talking to his granddaughter. Both him and evil stepmother had been quite active in her life for the first few years, and now both had written her off completely. As I write this, two years after my sister had exposed my dad, he's not spoken to her or even asked about his granddaughter once. I confronted him about this on several occasions, but he just kind of shrugged me off and told me that I've not once taken into account how hard these last two years have been on him. It also later turned out that evil stepmother was monitoring his phone, and I'm pretty sure she had been deleting any messages that my sister had tried sending to him. About this all being hard on him, he was right. You see, even though my dad may have brought this all upon himself, I do feel truly sorry for him. Evil stepmother had taken away from all of us what she deemed most important to us. With me, it was my house and all my memories. With my sister, it was her relationship with her father. And with my father, it was his freedom. She had taken away all forms of privacy and freedom he had left. She had taken control of his bank accounts, taken to monitoring his incoming messages, deleted all his friends from his Facebook account, and lost him his job. The new house they built even had an open bathroom that you literally could not pee in private in. It was disturbing and honestly very hard to witness. This story doesn't really have an ending. My sisters finally stopped trying to make up with my dad. The few times I've seen them have been under strict supervision from evil stepmother that usually ends with her fighting me and telling me what a stain I am on his life. Although I never saw my dad as any kind of saint, He was always my dad and I always loved him, still do, but the man he is now is no longer a man, he is a prisoner. Evil stepmother has turned him into a real life version of Theon Greyjoy, and I, for the life he is now living, feel nothing 
but sadness. If you had a close relative or maybe even a close friend and you saw them willingly allowing themselves to fall into this prisoner relationship, would you be willing to accept letting them go as far as being in your life? Or would you want to try to get through to them and explain how not healthy that relationship is? Is it a lost cause? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Demoted, then they realize they screwed up. Worked 9 years at a well-known company, worldwide provider of various products. Won't name this company, but it was a division of this company I worked for. I started at this company at the bottom as a tech, did my job well and excelled upwards. After 6 years, I was promoted into the national support group and also then excelled at this position. It was well paid and salary, which was a very nice bump in pay and the hours were great. After a year in the new position, I was promoted to a co-operator position, which I shared with another, which we were very good friends and got along very well. To this day, we still do lunches and chat quite frequently. To this day, we still do lunches and chat quite frequently. Now, I was trained up on the in-house software that runs the dispatching of techs, which was made by an in-house software developer, which the software used codes for areas and states. Very complex, but for him it worked, though no documentation whatsoever, no manual, nothing. The guy that had the position before me was leaving the company for a better offer, so he took a month to train me on the software, and of course, I wrote down all the codes for all the areas just so I didn't get anything wrong, since there were no manuals or instructions. He then leaves the company. A year later, the developer of the software dies from cancer so now no one but myself knows how to use the software, and taking vacations were far and few between due to this issue. I constantly asked for a backup to be trained so they can do this job while I go on vacations. At this point, I could only take two days at a time for vacation, and my wedding was coming up in eight months, and we were taking a month-long honeymoon. No go. Got denied every time I requested a replacement to be trained. When my co-operator and I took over this new department, it was in shambles. Our turnover for repairs was sitting around 8 days, which upset a lot of customers due to these machines being used constantly during working hours. We brainstormed and came up with solutions to fix this and reduce downtimes dramatically. The bad thing about this is that it put extreme pressure on logistics to get parts overnighted to techs in the field, which logistics manager was okay with. He in turn hired enough guys to take this burden on and was working out pretty well. This turned out to be great. We reduced our downtime from 8 days to on average 2 days. Customers commented constantly about how much better our service was and how they were definitely happy with how the repairs were going. Then it starts to go south from this point. My manager was looking to move up the ladder and needed to hire someone for his position. Of course, me and my co-operator apply for the position since we know how to run this division and think we could do the job great. We both get looked over for manager's friend which he had no experience in this division whatsoever. He was actually one of the logistics purchasers. He has no idea whatsoever on how to run our department, nor any technical experience whatsoever. He of course gets this position, and right off the bat, this stupid idiot wants to change how we do things and reduce the strain on the logistics group. Co-operator and myself immediately protest and oppose his changes with prejudice and vigor, though this fell on deaf ears. When he tells us to implement the changes, I refuse, and so does my co-operator. For weeks, we argue with manager's friend, which is now my manager, and he gets upset and continuously fights with us to make the changes. We again refuse. I emailed his manager and explained the situation and pointed out that it would increase repairs and our customers would be very unhappy. At this time, we grew the base of our customers 20 fold and our satisfaction rating on all our reviews were in the upper 90s. Though these emails and everything that co-operator and I were explaining went on deaf ears. At this point, manager's friend feels that I'm the instigator of the disobedience, and that week, I was called into a conference room with HR, manager's friend, and his manager. They informed me I was going to be demoted from operator to dispatcher due to my inability to be a team player and confrontational to my manager, etc, etc. So I said, fine with me, meant less work and same pay, so I'm okay with this. Now, with this job, you had certain functions of the job that you could and could not do. You could only do what was assigned to you for that job description. 
Dispatchers could only dispatch calls to techs and not assign their own calls. That was my previous job. My co-operator at the time was in charge of escalations and onboarding techs and did not know the system I used to dispatch these calls. Next day, I come in and sit at my desk, waiting for calls to be put on my board, knowing that there was no one now to dispatch calls to the dispatchers. After about four hours, I get approached by manager's friend, asking why I was not dispatching calls to everyone. I politely said, remember, I got demoted, I can't dispatch. It's not part of my job description, and I don't want to be fired for doing something that I'm not allowed to do. The dread on his face could be seen as it streaks up his back and hits him full force. At this point, he realized he just freaked up. Of course, his manager in HR didn't know anything about this software that was developed in-house and had no instructions on how to use it. It was the backbone of this division's dispatching software. Without this, no calls could be dispatched out whatsoever. The news is now getting around that no calls are being dispatched and manager's friend's manager now enters and asks what's going on. He soon realizes as well what happened. They then call me back into the conference room and ask me to train a replacement. Of course, I refuse. The day ends and I go home. Next morning, I show up for work on the dot and they call me back in yet again, offering my position back and to please start dispatching calls as soon as possible. Of course, I refuse the promotion, pointing out key points that they brought up during my demotion meeting on why they were demoting me. And because of those points, I felt I had to overcome them in order to be able to accept the promotion, and it would be a great time to focus on my abilities that they outlined. They were flabbergasted and frustrated clearly. They get upset and tell me that I'm holding the company hostage and that they'll have to take me to court. At this point, per my contract, I am now entitled to a lawyer and they have to pay. A few days go by, of course, no calls being dispatched. They're now relying on emails and phone calls to get calls dispatched and parts ordered and it's pandemonium abound. It's adding so much more time to each call and ordering parts, the whole system is falling apart. I finally get contacted by a lawyer telling me that he is to represent me and that he's being paid by the company I work for, but that he works for me, period. That he can't talk to them without my knowledge, he cannot do anything against my own interests, and that he is being paid by them but works for me. He goes on to tell me that they can't force me to take a promotion and they can't fire me if I fulfill my obligations of the employment contract, which was pretty easy, basically just show up on time, take breaks in specified time, and leave at specified time. So I do. This goes on for a month when they're finally getting to the breaking point. Repairs are exceeding two weeks and customers are canceling their repair contracts due to service issues. They decide to demote me again to logistics. Now, the manager of logistics is a good friend and he thinks this is retaliation for all these issues. So he just says to me to take a desk over in the corner and do my thing, whatever I wanted. He wasn't going to punish me for their stupidity. We go to court, they present their case, and my lawyer presents mine. After two days, the judge rules in favor of me and says that a company can't force me into a job or doing a job that I do not wish, and this would be considered enslavement. They press the judge to have me turn over the information to run the software that runs their division. The judge asked me if I had written it down. At this point, I didn't have it. I threw it away, so I answered honestly to the judge. Though I did say, I do remember how to use it and all the codes to dispatch since I did it for years. It became like second nature. Judge asked me if I would be willing to write down the instructions. I politely said no. Judge said, okay, that's that then. Upon coming back to work the next day, I decided to start looking for another job. After about a month, I found a new position at another company, making about 10% more and with better options, and also agreed to give me the month off with salary for my honeymoon. So I wrote up a resignation letter and sent it to my manager, his manager, and the senior staff of the division, and also the CEO of the company, explaining everything that went on and why I was leaving the company and wish them the best. That Friday, I packed up my personal stuff and left. Two weeks later, I get a call from the CEO of the company apologizing for what happened and that all this information just came to light and that the individuals involved were terminated. Manager's friend, his manager, and the one above him, which was sweet to my ears, and offered my job back, I politely declined. 
A few weeks after manager's friend was fired, I was told by my good friend and co-operator that he passed from a drug overdose, which is sad and completely not deserved, no matter how much I hated him. The division I ran was merged into another division a year later, after it was not able to recover. 30% of the people that worked for that division were laid off or transferred to other divisions. My co-operator is still working for the same company, though he said that after this whole ordeal, it never recovered and was never the same and had gone downhill dramatically, and he'll be retiring this year. If a job you're working for was just full of nepotism and incompetence, they didn't help you out and then demoted you for saving their butts? Would that be enough to make you just say, screw it, you guys are gonna sink the company and I'm not helping you anymore, good luck. Let me know what you would do in the comments down below. And our final story of the day is by Sub to Dead Meat. Abusive husband loses his family, house, visa, dignity, and a hundred thousand dollars. This story happened in Lebanon, Australia. Lebanon in that order, so please bear with me. My cousin, Australian, has just met a wonderful person. He cared for her, loved her, and really treated her in a special, caring way. Or so we thought. One day, she came in the middle of the night to my house, and then I saw her. With her son, both had bruises on their face. As it turns out, he just married her for the privileges as an Australian. So when they got a son, she got pressured to handle the harm and stay with him just so that she can see her son. And now, this guy is gonna pay. My family and I devised an elaborate plan to send the cousin and her son to Australia, where she has more custody rights over there. But we also had to make her get some money to start off her business there as well. First we went to the police, who said that they can't arrest him because the cousin didn't report him, but they don't mind us taking care of him. So, later that night, one of my cousins and I attacked him with bars of soap wrapped in a towel. No bruises or wounds, and we hit him until they broke. And after he went to the police station to report us, they laughed at him. After he got out, we warned him to leave Lebanon before we seriously hurt him. And after that confrontation, he got his wife, son, and a hundred thousand dollars. Here came the tricky part. We had to have incriminating evidence of his harm against her to blackmail him. We can't attack him in Australia. So, after my aunt helped them get a house, she rigged a camera, and after she captured the harm and the time of the recordings, my cousin took her son and a hundred thousand dollars. When the guy tried to confront her and take his son and money back to Lebanon, he was shown the incriminating footage and given an ultimatum. He either leaves Australia without divorcing the wife with the son, and he might not stay alive, we roughed him up for roughing up the son, or he leaves Australia penniless. And he chose the latter. When he made it back to Lebanon, he slipped into alcoholism, he lost his family and his house due to his temper issues, lost his visa since his ex-wife reported him anyway, and is currently a homeless man. I saw him while I was in the car in Lebanon, I'm currently stuck there, and he looked so empty. Even when he saw me and recognized me, but he didn't react. And then I realized that I made him lose everything. Even his Australian visa got revoked, but then he realized that this man deserved it. My cousin is currently running a restaurant with her new husband, who has a daughter, and is a truly amazing guy. Disclaimer, no illegal actions happened in this story other than what the husband did. So admittedly, I don't know very much about Lebanon, but I feel like I've learned just a little bit more about kind of how their police force works at least probably in some areas. Seems like they're a little bit supportive of the vigilante system. That said, a lot of times I can kind of think through things and imagine how some people make some callous decisions or cheat people over, but I can't for the life of me ever put myself in some mindset of somebody that coerces anybody by harming them, especially kids. To me, I feel like if you're going to go to that extent, I feel like you're beyond being redeemable. A lot of people, you might feel bad for them ending up homeless, but this guy, 
you can't feel bad for him at all. They lost their family, house, visa, dignity, and $100,000. And what this guy did was so bad that you probably would go, yeah, well, kind of serves him right, doesn't it? All I know is OP is good family to have, and I'm glad that OP's cousin was able to get back to Australia, get a wealth of money and a good start, and get into a situation that's good for their future. I'm glad that things are really looking up. Grandpa gave up what time he had left for revenge on my behalf. I grew up dealing with a lot of mental health issues as my mother's a drug addict and my father liked to ignore my existence as I'm the result of a one night stand while he was married. So needless to say, his wife hated me and their children treated me horribly as well. The only good people I had in my life was my grandma and grandpa on my father's side. I love them and spent a lot of time at my grandpa's business. I'll explain that a little later. Now at 14, everything went further downhill. I won't go into details, but my mother almost passed away, and I met a man, let's name him Goat. He looked like one. Long story short, Goat was 25 at the beginning and harmed me in every way you could think of. While I was under the precent that I loved him and it was okay, he pushed me away from my grandparents and isolated me for two years until a friend helped me get out of it. During this next year, Goat stalked me, threatened me, and had me absolutely terrified. I was afraid to go to the police as I didn't want to bring harsh light to my grandpa's business and because I was afraid. I was staying at my friend's house for a while during this time as my panic attacks and what I now know as PTSD was horrible and I hated to be alone. During this time, my grandmother passed away, one of the only lights in my life left, so I became worse. I began drinking and going to parties and trying to forget my life. Right before my 18th birthday, Goat made a real life appearance again on my way back from a big party. He jumped me, left me black and blue and nearly killed me. I was found and taken to a hospital where they began treating me and as I was underage, they asked me to call an adult in my life that they could talk to. I tried to call my father but he didn't pick up. Knowing my mother wasn't going to help, I had to call my grandfather. He was at the hospital in lightning speed and for the first time in my life, I watched this man that had built his own empire really break down. Even at my grandma's funeral, he didn't cry. I spent two months in the hospital with police questioning me and my grandpa by my side every day. During this time, he met my friend who also helped me out of it all at the beginning and became very close to him. My grandfather helped me get on my feet for a whole year until one day he had a large family gathering and socialized the whole time taking me with him. That night I will never forget. We went to get ice cream and then he just hugged me for a very long time, holding me tight and reassuring me everything would be okay. The next day, my grandpa exacted his revenge. Now my grandpa was the owner of a well-off law firm that also had private detectives in a smaller office in his building. He apparently tracked down Goat and went about his revenge. My grandpa shot Goat three times in the stomach and once in the chest. Goat passed away in the hospital later that day while my grandpa was taken in and soon put in jail for manslaughter which he pled guilty to. I never got the chance to visit my grandpa in jail as he passed away soon after in jail from complications. One week after my grandpa's death, I got a call from his solicitor and he asked me to go in. I was met with a lengthy letter from my grandpa, which was nothing but loving and showed that he'd found out he had terminal lung cancer and wouldn't live much longer. But he couldn't happily leave me alone in this world without Goat being gone too. My grandpa left almost everything to me. At 20, I would inherit the law firm and could do as I pleased with it and I inherited 95% of his savings, his house he lived in with grandpa and his other assets. In case anyone's interested, I turned 21 last week, I'm currently working at the law firm, my grandpa's secretary, now the CEO, has taken over the important things in the building and makes most of the decisions. I spent half the money I was given in locked saving funds for all the younger family members to go to college when it's time. I cut off all contact with my father, who tried to steal money from me during the death arrangements of grandpa. My friend, mentioned earlier in the story, is now my fiancé and we're getting married next summer. I'm still suffering from PTSD and depression, but it's getting better every day. I'm in therapy for my PTSD treatment. I got a tattoo for my grandpa and my grandma on my back of two lions protecting a cub. I also opened up a safe house for anyone going through any kind of harm. No matter the race, gender, or age, I'm trying to help anyone I can in that situation. Besides for what I've put away for later in life, I'm also thinking of opening up the bakery I always wanted and employing the people that need the job and help the most. 
but I'm unsure at the moment about that. My grandpa and grandma were a godsend, and to this day I miss them greatly, but I know I couldn't have changed the stubborn old man's mind even if I tried. Well, I would say that was a very serious revenge. I'm kind of curious, do you guys blame the grandpa at all for what they did? I mean, their revenge was really, really something. I'd like to know what you guys think in the comments down below. And our final story of the day is by Creed Morewolf 666 Bratty kid hurts my cat until she fights back. For a quick background, I babysit in my home sometimes as a side job. I have two cats and one dog. One of my cats is a super sweet tuxedo cat named Bella, and she also works as my personal therapy animal. She would rather run away than confront someone, so not a lot of people who know her often expect her to be capable of exploding into a heckish rage. One kid had to find out the hard way, and as far as I know, he's been respectful of kids since then. This kid, who we'll call Spoiled Brat, really lives up to his nickname. He was probably one of the worst kids I've had to deal with, and I'm usually pretty relaxed when it comes to babysitting. He was always stealing things, making messes, and throwing tantrums over literally nothing. I'm pretty sure he has some kind of mental disability, but since he was only six at the time, I never wanted to voice my concerns. But out of all of the things this boy did, whenever he stayed with me, the one thing he knew could push my buttons was hurting my animals. He would pull my cat's tails and ears, kick them, chase them, and I caught him throwing rocks at them more than once. And my poor dog, who had a part-time job visiting kids in hospitals, had to deal with this little terror too. Because of his training, when he got tired of the kid, he just left the house and disappeared up in the woods until he heard the kid's parents arrive and take him away. I felt so bad for Duke, my dog, that I ended up teaching him the time to go phrase, which is our code for spoiled brat is here so you better go before he sees you, and I would even leave the shed door open so Duke had a place with water and a bed until the kid left. I had spoken to the parents many times about spoiled brat's behavior, and how it was unacceptable in my house, and if it continued I would raise my rate, which was already low to begin with in order to pay for damages and possibly even vet bills. The parents said they would work with this on Spoiled Brat, but every time he came back, there was no obvious progress. One day, I had settled Spoiled Brat in for his nap and was working on an online certification class when I heard him get up to use the bathroom. At first, I thought nothing of it, since that's normally part of his routine, but what happened five minutes later scared the daylights out of me. I hear an ungodly howl from the bathroom, and I'm still not sure if it was Bella or Spoiled Brat that made it, but Spoiled Brat comes running to me. His hands, chest, face, and even his back are scratched and bloody, and Bella comes after him, snarling and spitting in a crazed rage. Her entire body is soaked right up to her ears. Her eyes are the size of saucers, and her nose in one of her paws is actually bleeding. I quickly usher Bella into my room, where she takes refuge under my bed. I call my vet and say I have an animal emergency, but I can't take her on the half mile drive to his office. Luckily, he says he can send his assistant, and I hang up and deal with Spoiled Brat's wounds. Of course, Spoiled Brat is wailing and screaming and in a great deal of pain, and I'm doing my best to stay calm and not jump to conclusions, but it's rather difficult not to after how abusive he's been. I just remind myself to tend to his wounds first before I find out what happened and do my best to stay composed. I'm going to explain really quick that I do have a camera system in my garage where the bathroom's located. From where the camera is, you can see into the bathroom, but you can't see the toilet, so a child can use the bathroom in privacy. My doors have locks, so whenever I babysit, the door is rigged to stay open to prevent a child from locking him or herself inside and potentially hurting themselves or causing damage. The camera was actually originally intended to catch any burglars that come into my garage, but it came in handy in this situation as well. At first, I didn't think about my hidden camera. I made sure Spoiled Brad was on the couch resting, his wounds dressed, and a glass of milk with painkillers on the table for him. Then I went to the bathroom. The sight that greeted me was even more shocking than Spoiled Brat's wounds and Bella's rage. There was fur all over the bathroom, bloody paw prints on the wall and blood on the floor too. As I stepped through all this to the sink, I nearly went into a fury myself. The sink, which is about a foot and a half deep and about two feet wide, designed for shops, 
was almost completely full of steaming hot water. So hot it actually burned my finger when I tested it. And it had cat fur and blood in it as well as a pair of scissors. I was horrified. I'm not sure what Spoiled Brat was trying to do to my cat, but it was then that I remembered my hidden camera and I rushed to get the footage. As I watched, I became so angry I was tempted to walk out and bend Spoiled Brat over my knee myself. In fact, I wished I could slap that kid silly, but I knew this would be better handled in a court situation, where this kid can get the help he seriously needed. The footage showed Spoiled Brat coaxing Bella into the bathroom with a handful of food, after filling the sink almost to the brim. He lunged and grabbed her by the neck, and at this point she's already struggling and clawing him. He forced her head underwater, and in the footage you could see her tail and legs flailing as she tried to escape. Somehow she got free of him, and though I expected her to run at this point, instead she tore into spoiled brat like a wild animal. As he tried to grab her and force her back into the sink, she claws his face, tore at his chest, and then raked her way down his back. All the while, he's trying to get a hold of her tail. I'm stunned when he grabs a pair of hair trimming scissors off the shelf and runs after her with them. But I think the pain set in because he dropped the scissors, panicked for a moment, threw the scissors in the sink, and ran inside, a furious black cat chasing after him. I made careful note that Bella immediately stopped attacking him once she was out of his grasp, and did not touch him after he dropped the scissors and ran inside. The vet's assistant arrived and was as shocked as I was about the situation. She treated Bella gently and gave my cat some mild sedatives while I explained everything that happened. She was angry too, and she said she would happily support me in court with this clear evidence of abuse. Bella had swallowed a lot of water, and one of her claws had actually gotten ripped out in her mad dash through the garage to escape spoiled brat. She'd been stressed and jumpy for a very long time, and I prayed this would not affect her job as my therapy animal. The parents were called once everything was somewhat in order, and I didn't even give them a chance to be angry. I told them, Pick up your child, I'll see you in court. The court case wasn't even a challenge. With my camera footage and the testimony from the vet and the vet assistant, I won more than enough money, I'm not going to say how much, for damages, vet bills, and an extra month's paycheck so I could find a new client to work for. In addition, Spoiled Brat would not be allowed to have pets of any kind until he had gone through multiple different stages of therapy for his behavior and would be registered as an animal abuser in case future incidents happened when he became an adult. Some of you might ask why I tolerated it for so long, and mostly it was because all the times I tried to tell the parents to curb his behavior, I was nervous about kicking up dust or causing trouble, and I couldn't afford to drop a client at the time. But after this horrible experience, I will never tolerate such behavior again regardless of how much I'm getting paid to deal with it. As for Bella, she was relatively unaffected by the incident, and still remains her sweet and lovable self. She still enjoys having her seasonal baths, and will intrude on my privacy whenever she wants, but I hope Spoiled Brad learned a very big lesson. He saw Bella as nothing but prey, and I don't think he ever expected Bella to turn the tables the way she did. I also hope that spoiled brat will get his life straight and learn to be respectful to both animals and people. And next time he feels like he can treat an animal like garbage, I hope he'll remember the terrifying rage a seemingly harmless house cat unleashed on him. His parents also try to write a formal apology to me for allowing their son to behave that way, which was an order given by the judge. Reading it was very amusing because I just knew they hated writing every single word. The letter said, Dear Miss OP, We apologize for our son's behavior and we sincerely hope Bella will recover quickly. His behavior was by no means acceptable, nor was our lack of attempt to prevent it. We also apologize for the damages in your home and the stress this has caused you. We also recognize your tolerance of spoiled brat and are sorry you didn't speak out sooner so such an incident could be avoided. We hope both you and your cat will recover and never have to deal with a situation like this again. Our formal apologies and best wishes, entitled parents. You gotta love that even after knowing what their kids did, watching the video of what their kid did, and having a court-ordered mandate to write this apology letter, they still managed to slip in a whole sentence of how it's OP's fault. Sorry you didn't speak out sooner so such an incident could be avoided. 
OP said that they've been trying to speak out about it. Maybe not so blatantly, but they very clearly said that they discussed the kid's behavior. I don't think these parents learned anything, and I'm concerned this brat's just gonna grow up to hate animals even more. A friend set up my dad, and he was nearly beaten to death. My grandfather got revenge on everyone involved. This isn't my story, but it comes from my dad and other family members who witnessed it. This all went down in the late 1970s when my dad was 17. The area he grew up in was in the UK and was a stereotypical working class town. The part of town my family lived in was run down, full of poor families, and had its fair share of crime. But it was close-knit and everyone knew everyone. This will be important later. Now, my dad wasn't the most well-behaved kid, and he had hated being at school, but aside from a speeding ticket, he had never been in trouble with the police. He was, and still is, a really talented musician and had a very active social life. For his 17th birthday, one of his friends had bought him a leather jacket with a very specific logo on it. We'll call this Friend Dave for future reference. According to my dad, it was a rare and quite expensive motorcycle jacket. He was extremely happy that Dave had got it for him. Dave had bought himself the same jacket a while before, and it was a big surprise. My grandmother apparently joked that with the jackets on, they looked like twins and she wasn't far wrong. They had similar features, black hair, and were both well known for being kitted out in motorcycle gear. A few days after my dad's birthday, he was leaving work as a bartender in the town center at around 10 p.m. As he was getting close to where his bike was parked, a gang of five men approached him from behind. The last thing my dad remembers was being smacked over the head and passing out as he hit the floor. These men beat up my dad with bike chains and a crowbar, literally to within an inch of his life. Luckily, two bouncers from a nearby pub had heard the commotion and rushed to help. The men ran off, the bouncers called the cops, and my dad was taken to the hospital. It turned out that Dave had quite a substantial gambling habit and owed a large amount of money to people who you really didn't want to owe money to. They had threatened Dave and told him that they would be looking for him to teach him a lesson. So Dave decided to set up my dad to take the beating instead of himself, or at least lessen his chances of taking it. He had bought my dad the same jacket because these guys knew that that's what he wore when he rode. He then arranged for a guy he knew to find out when my dad left work and call up the loan sharks to let them know where Dave was. What a scumbag. The revenge? My grandfather and grandmother were obviously distraught about this whole thing. The first thought on my grandfather's mind was if my dad would survive. When that was answered, his second was how to best get revenge. A bit of background on my grandfather, he was a lifelong boxer and a career military man. He enlisted at the back end of World War II at 17, stayed in the forces through Korea, and then served in Malaya and Burma as a scout and sniper during the mid to late 1950s. He only reluctantly retired when my dad was little and worked as an engineer after his discharge. This guy was certified bad to the bone even into his 50s, and although he wasn't the best husband or father at times, he could never stand by and watch his family get hurt. The first move my grandfather made was to call up every ex-service buddy, bouncer, pub, landlord, etc. that he knew, and even a few less than legit characters he knew from the pubs. In my town, word traveled fast, and my grandfather was well liked and had a bit of a reputation, so it wasn't long before he had the names and addresses of the five men who attacked my dad. Apparently these guys had been bragging about beating up a defenseless man from behind. These guys were career criminals with violent reputations, but my grandfather really didn't give a crap who or what they were. My grandfather then called up a few of the most dangerous, hardened guys he knew from the service. He explained to them what had happened, and they were all happy to help. One night, the group kicked in the doors of each thug and beat them to a pulp, all five of them. They knew that if they hit one, the others would hear about it and run, so they hit all five of them in one night. My grandfather knew that no one would call the police in the area they lived in. Talking to the cops was a big no-no in that area back then, so there was little chance of being caught. All five guys ended up bloodied with broken bones, shattered teeth, and the requirement to be fed from a tube by the end of the night. One of them had to be put into a medically induced coma. Of course, the police interviewed all of them in the hospital when they sufficiently recovered, but none of them talked, both out of fear of my grandfather and fear that they would be labeled as rats, and nothing came of it. But my grandfather wasn't done there. 
My grandfather used his connections in the clubs and bars to start spreading rumors about why they'd been beaten up. Soon, it had gotten round that these guys had messed up and had beaten up the wrong person. Not only that, but they'd bragged about it and lied to whoever they worked for about it. Not only were they physically broken, but my grandfather ruined their credibility so that when they got out, no one, criminal or otherwise, wanted to be associated with them. Once this was all done, my grandfather turned his attention to Dave. He had specifically left Dave for last, knowing that he would crap himself knowing that my grandfather knew what he had done. My grandfather, however, was much more subtle in dealing with Dave as he thought that a simple beating would be too good for him. He waited and asked around, and it turned out that Dave was not only a compulsive gambler, but had also recently turned into a heavy drug addict as well. My grandfather found out who he was buying his drugs from, where he would usually buy, and where. He had a buddy of his follow Dave when he went to buy his stuff, follow him to where he was living, and let my grandfather know. My grandfather then called in an anonymous tip that there was a huge drug deal going on at the address, and he thought he had heard gunshots. He had two of his buddies do the same. The police investigated, searched the house, and caught Dave red-handed with boatloads of drugs in his home as well as counterfeit bills and a ton of other illegal stuff. Dave was charged, denied bail, and ended up pleading guilty to all the charges laid against him. My dad could never remember his exact sentence, but it was definitely heavy, at least 15 years. To add to that, Dave owed a lot of money to a lot of people and, let's just say his time in prison, was made much worse by this fact. My dad never spoke to him again, his parents disowned him, his girlfriend dumped him, he struggled to get a job with his record, and when he got out, he had to move miles away, as no one he knew wanted anything to do with him. My dad eventually recovered from his injuries, although you can still see various scars on his body from the beating he took. My grandfather never told anyone what he had done until my dad asked him about it when he got really ill in the early 1990s. Dave's life was ruined, and out of the five who attacked my dad, three ended up in prison later in life, and two ended up dead due to crime. My grandfather passed away in the late 1990s, and although my dad and him had their issues, it could never be said he didn't look out for him when he needed it. So obviously this is a pretty insane nuclear revenge. OP's grandfather really felt like a mafia boss pulling their connections around it, kind of put a hit in. Considering the scumbag that Dave was and what they did to OP's father, do you think Dave and the five men deserved what they got in the end? Or do you think maybe it was a bit much? Let me know what you think in the comments. And our final story of the day is by Elebron Mystic. My dad's ex-girlfriend robs us and he gets even. Okay, for reference, I was a young teen, around 14 or 15. My father had a rough time with women and always seemed to have bad luck with them. Until he started dating an old high school friend that we'll just call Susan. She was a cool woman. I was glad my dad found love in his life again. He deserved it. Susan was kind to me and even had two kids of her own. One younger and one older than me, but they didn't come around often. My dad dated her off and on for over a year, thinking he was super lucky. But soon we started having problems that escalated until the breaking point. I'll start from the beginning and you'll see that I'm not lying when I say that Susan is an evil woman. Susan is a struggling drug addict that my dad knew about and had tried to help her through it, but she was always fighting him on it and had moments of pure rage. I hate when people yelled and fought with each other. I'm kind of emotional and I start getting weepy. I don't know why. Anyway, my dad had a bad accident when he was hunting behind our woods behind our house. He was coming down and halfway down he fell and perfectly landed one of his legs on a rock that completely shattered his kneecap. He had to have surgery and go on heavy pain medication to keep him comfortable. Three weeks and he came home, but needed crutches for months and still had some heavy pain meds. Enter Susan who was hardly around during the hospital during my dad's entire stay. She would end up sneaking my dad's pills when he was asleep and just abuse them all the time. My dad ended up hiding them from her. That was the moment things went downhill. First, she tried to convince me to steal my dad's meds so she could take them. 
saying that if two or three go missing, he won't know. I was appalled at what I was hearing. I refused and I thought her behavior was out of line, but my dad still believed she was a good person. Next, I have to admit that I suffer from low self-esteem and emotional anxiety from time to time. It was a while after the pill issue that Susan came home and was trying to convince me to run away from my dad because he didn't care about me anymore. I was in a bad time in my life and she succeeded in making me do just that. I did come back afterwards when I was found on the road by police. She was turning me and my dad against each other and got us literally yelling at each other. But we resolved this and after some reflection, we both realized that for all the major problems we have had happen, Susan was the instigator. My dad promised she'd be gone soon. And wouldn't you know it, dad found out she was actually cheating on him. He walked in on her and her ex when he went to her place to break up. It made his choice a lot easier. Susan was gone. We finally had our lives back. Or so we thought. One day, I came home from school and went into our house to find that it was completely trashed. I was shocked and confused and didn't know what was going on. My dog was acting normal and happy to see me, but everything was wrecked. I looked around and saw my Xbox 360 and Wii were stolen along with most of my games. My dad's room was also in tatters, so I decided to call my dad to ask what was going on. A family friend actually showed up during this and looked around too. My dad rushed home and was absolutely furious when he went inside. Our friend left and dad checked around and noticed that only his pills were stolen from his room. We knew instantly that it was Susan. Our dog was acting normal because she knew Susan and was used to her. That's how she didn't get mauled by our dog and was able to rob us. Instantly, my dad began to figure out what to do. I suggested that we call the police, but my dad refused. He called Dibs. Being ex-military, even with a bad leg, made him a dangerous man to mess over. He found out that her ex, a Russian dude that's a wannabe gangster, helped rob us. My dad acted as swiftly as possible and, to be honest, I was scared. I thought he'd literally kill the both of them. It took four days for my dad to find out where they were staying. They moved in together at his house. My dad told me to stay home and drove over there at night with a baseball bat and his favorite pocket knife. Around midnight, he came back and I saw stuff in the back of our car. He told me that my consoles were sold away and he couldn't have gotten them back. I asked what happened and he sat me down. He had went down and found that the both of them were there that night. And he honked his horn real loud and they came out. Susan didn't recognize the car in time and her ex, let's call him Tim, got scared to death as my dad got out, bat in hand. Now this dude was supposed to be a bad to the bone gangster that would beat anyone down and my dad was only just recovered enough to not need crutches anymore. So in the favor of odds, you'd expect Timmy to be itching to fight knowing he'd win. But he caved in. My dad had a reputation of being the guy who'll beat down anyone who messes with our family. He's beaten a few people around town that's hurt our friends or family. Tim apparently got on his knees and begged for his life and that he'd do anything. And my dad, being the saint he is, told him to give him all his clothes. Tim couldn't tear them off fast enough. Susan was about to go in the house, presumably to call the police, when my dad told her not to move or he'd baseball bat Tim very seriously. He grabbed the clothes and told them to never come near our house again or else. He also assured them that he'd be back. I was shocked, but glad my dad didn't kill anyone. He told me that I wasn't going to school tomorrow because I was coming with him to Susan's house. So the next day at noon, we show up and Tim immediately has him in his bedroom. My dad told me to get the big cardboard box he loaded up yesterday. We went in and he told Susan that he was taking their DVD collection. He went over and told me to take them all which I did, albeit reluctantly. I was a bit uncomfortable with the situation, but was in awe of how bad to the bone my dad was being. He yelled for Tim and that dude ran right in like a dog and sat down on the couch. My dad told him he had a week to get out of our town. If he didn't, he'd have a bad time. Tim agreed profusely and my dad and me walked out. But before we left, my dad stopped and turned to Tim and told him to give him his clothes again. I watched Slackjawed as Tim hurriedly pulled his clothes off and gave them to my dad. We eventually went home. They never called the cops. Too afraid, I guess, of the authorities or my dad. I don't know which, but we haven't heard from them since. Good riddance. 
Considering they literally broke in and robbed you of everything, sold your gaming consoles, it was pretty scummy lowlife stuff. The only thing is, what's with the clothes thing? Like, is this some submissive tactic? I don't know, it just... There was something about that detail that took this story from, like, a really bad-to-the-bone story of revenge, and partly turned it into some, like weird embarrassment satisfaction thing i don't know but it was pretty harsh revenge i was fired and took my boss co-workers and the business down with me after uni late 2018 i fell on rough times and was forced to move back to my hometown i tried to transfer my job to a branch in my area but failed thus i needed to get a new job i settled for a 20 hour a week job at a bookies with a second bartending job in the evenings The bookies is the target for my revenge, which was entirely accidental. Involved are the following, Janelle, my manager's manager, Shay, my manager, Jorge and Gordon, my co-workers, and Kara, a co-worker at another store who's relevant later. I ended up working behind the counter as a customer service manager, basically a step up from a cashier. It's fancy when seen on a CV, but there's really nothing to it. I took bets, chatted with customers, helped people with machines, and for the vast majority of my shift, sat around waiting for something to do. I got on well with my co-workers, or so I thought, and had no major issues. It was 20 hours a week, about one pound more than minimum wage, with a lot of overtime required of me and irregular shift patterns. Though I had no issue with the job, beyond how difficult it was to juggle the schedules of both my jobs. In February of 2019, after working for the company for six months, I was invited to a probation hearing. It cannot be emphasized enough that it was a probation hearing in which I would have my performance reviewed, as informed in training, and was entitled to a pay raise at the end of it. I arrived that morning to a disciplinary hearing where, without even a shred of evidence, I was accused of 11 different cash discrepancies dating back to early November of 2018, shortly after I'd started, which all amounted to 271 pounds, all but one of which I'd never heard of before. These had apparently been reported and logged by my manager Shay and my co-workers, despite no one saying a word to me at all. Not a whisper in the five months this had apparently been occurring. I was told that it was unacceptable, a call was made to HR, and I was terminated on the spot and forced to hand over my keys and to never set foot in the store again. To my protests, I was told the decision could not be appealed and I would eventually receive written confirmation of my employment's termination in the post. I didn't let myself slump around and feel sorry for myself, so on the way home, I opened up Indeed and applied for a bunch of jobs, and before I arrived home, had an interview set up for the next week at what is my current place of work. Now I was furious, fuming at having gone to what I thought should have been a normal probation meeting and having effectively been called a thief and been banned for life from a place I'd never go to anyway. But somehow, my parents were angrier and ordered me to let them know and they got into contact with me again. Almost two weeks later, I received an email from the company's HR which reiterated the accusations and stated again that I was terminated. My mom sat me down in her kitchen and walked me through a letter response that was two parts professional and three parts scathing ripping into them about their unprofessional conduct, their ludicrous claims, their lack of evidence, the holes in their story, because there were quite a few, and finally the cherry on the cake, the employment laws they'd broken. Now I didn't want much, just a nice reference, a promise that not a whisper of these accusations would turn up when my new job asked them for a reference, because by then I'd already been offered the job. I then attached the letter to an email to fire back at their HR department. Then I added Janelle's work email, then her boss's email, and finally, the holding company that owned the brand, because I wanted to make sure this was seen. A bit of background, the bookies I worked for is a brand that's owned by an international company. Their name behind the scenes is slapped on everything, and they pretty much dictate everything we did. I'm not sure if holding company is the correct term, but I'll stick to that for now. Anyway, I sent this email with a 48 hour window for a response. I received a reply the next day from the same email that my demands were being met. I smirked victoriously and moved on with my life, happy to wash my hands with the entire ordeal. However, I'd set off a chain reaction that I wouldn't know about until three months later. 
Three months on, I'd settled into my new job, a call center position with double the hours and a well over double the pay. I'd gone through training and was settling into my new position when I see a new set of the trainees settling in near my team. Among them was Gordon, one of my coworkers from the bookies. I was stunned. Gordon had been at the bookies for six years when I joined. He was well liked, good at his job and a favorite of the managers. There was no way he'd been fired, though I didn't really want to talk to him as I was of the impression that he, Jorge, and my manager had likely set me up. I did want to know what happened. Luckily, on seeing me in the break room one shift, he sought me out and told me everything. Apparently, my email had been read by the higher-ups in the holding company and had caused a lot of scrutiny to fall under the bookies in our town of which there were three in our area that Janelle was responsible for, two in my town and a third in a neighboring one. Someone in HR passed a message down to the area manager, Janelle's boss, claiming they wanted things investigated and they wanted results yesterday, causing him to drop everything and descend on our little town with the panic and aggression of a man whose superiors were watching his every breath. He went to Janelle wanting to know why he hadn't been made aware previously that I was apparently stealing money, why I had been given keys to the shop and shifts on my own, when allegations of that nature were attributed to me, and why I hadn't been put under investigation. Turns out, Janelle had in fact put in my employee file that I was under investigation, but had never actually gone through with any of the official procedures for monitoring and investigating me. Shock horror. Thus, she had fired me for the accused crime without looking into it at all, falsely claiming otherwise. Thus, the area manager took the dates and amounts of the cash discrepancies, confirmed that they'd been reported on those days, without my knowledge, in Shay's own logbook of the shop's cash, and sent that information onto our security team to investigate. Another little detail is that the CCTV for every shop in the brand is outsourced to a private security company who monitors each shop remotely and has access to all the cameras and video. As was procedure, they looked into the dates mentioned to see if I'd been doing anything untoward. I know I wasn't and nothing was ever said to me, but they did find something. Turns out money was going missing from the shop. But surprise, surprise, it wasn't me, but Jorge and Shay. They not only set me up for reasons I'll never know, but were also falsifying numbers and cash checks on the system to hide it. One thing Shay was caught doing was deliberately shortchanging customers by taking portions of their winnings without them even knowing it. Bear in mind, a lot of our customers were elderly men and women. Gordon claims that he once opened the shop, after I and Shay had closed the night before and noticed a cash difference, but had been told not to say anything to me as I was under investigation and it could compromise it. He did apologize and I let it go. Needless to say, Jorge and Shay were fired, but it doesn't end there. Our team was small. Including me, there were a total of four people working at the store. As they hadn't been able to hire anyone to replace me, Jorge and Shay's termination meant Gordon was the only employee at the busiest shop in our area. Even if they'd been able to get other colleagues from the two other shops to help out, it wouldn't have been enough to keep the shop open and manage the amount of customers. So they closed the location down until they could get the staff to run it. It was at this point that Gordon handed in his resignation and applied for his job at my work, meaning they had no one. On top of that, Gordon's girlfriend worked in the same shop as Janelle and she relayed that she was rarely at their store in the other town for the next few weeks before the area manager reported she was fired as well. No reason given to her. I was later issued an apology for everything by the area manager and informed she, Janelle, was no longer with the company in an email sometime later. But somehow it doesn't end there. With the store I worked at closed, this one being on the high street and where most people preferred to go, The only other location in town was the much smaller location in the suburbs, the one where Kara worked alone. She suddenly received an influx of customers in her tiny store space and absolutely no support from other staff or upper management. Thus, for her own mental health, having already been underworked and underpaid, running an entire store by herself, she quit meaning that location had to be closed down too. All of this was at the worst possible time. March, when the Sheltonham Festival was occurring, 
which is a huge money maker for the gambling industry, even in a small town like ours. An opportunity the three other bookies on the high street reaped the benefits of instead of my old place, as the former customers went to them instead. As it currently stands, just over a year later, both shops remain closed, and I'm currently entering a job in cybersecurity, the training for which I paid for with my current job. Thanks for firing me, idiots. You did me a favor. If you discovered you were unjustly fired and could probably get some more demands like maybe you could take it to court and get some kind of severance package or something, but you also had already landed a much better job elsewhere, would you undergo that process to stick it to them or would you rather move on and not have to deal with that drama and stress? Let me know what you would do in the comments down below. And our final story of the day is by Ordos Deluxe. I knock the divisional manager off his pedestal. I work for a large global IT company, and my team were part of a larger extended team, and an even larger still divisional team. The manager of this division is called Raj. He's based in the States and is what many would call the poster boy definition of a corporate suck up. According to him, he's in constant video chats with the CEO and has a lot of face to face interaction with him. He also appears on much of our division's promotional emails and photographic material, so he's a company-wide recognized person. As for me, I'm a trench-working techie from Scotland, my direct manager is always happy with my performance, and I'm somewhat known in our extended team but not so much in the divisional team. Until this event, which was a while before the COVID outbreak, although I was aware of Raj and his reputation, I'd never worked with him directly. I got invited to a company-wide collaboration event in America, which we usually use for technical training and innovation discussion. We got there, and there were some initial social events and meet and greets. Raj was among the group, and his general demeanor seemed appropriate for the reputation which followed him. We went into the first day bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. I was assigned to a group of 10 people to work on a problem with some coding. All was going well, until we came to do some group presentations. For our group, a young woman named Natalie was speaking for our results. It all seemed to go okay, but after the session was over, Raj asked to see Natalie out in the hall. From inside the room, we could hear Raj literally screaming at her. Many, many offensive slurs were used, and we could hear banging on the wall as well. Natalie returned to the room a sobbing mess, much to the shock of everyone. Raj returns as if nothing had happened. This pattern continued over the course of the week. Raj would single out people for these one-on-one -on -one performance critiques. He would go into detail about how work was substandard and how they needed to improve, all while taking group photos for corporate comms for the higher-ups, orchestrating shots to make us all look like one big happy family. I spoke to some of my own team back home about this in my downtime, and it does turn out that this has always been rumored behavior for him. Just no one ever knew someone who had experienced it before. I don't know what the job culture is like for this role in a place like America, but here we have dignity at work regulations. Performance criticism is fine, but not when you're engaging in a ritualistic humiliation of your employees. I knew exactly what I was going to do. For the next few days, I made sure that I was delivering more presentations than anyone else and really making an effort to attract attention. As hoped, he asked me for a chat and pulled me into the hall. He didn't wait for the door to close before starting his rant. Experiencing it firsthand was interesting. He claimed I had no idea what I was talking about, even though it had likely been about 20 years since he did any technical work himself. He was vile, shouting and spitting in my face. I also learned what those banging noises were. He would punch doors and slam his hands on the wall near me, as if to try and intimidate me. I was prepared mentally though, and just smiled and nodded during the entire rant. He looked angry that I was reacting this way, and by the end of it, I thought he was legitimately going to burst a blood vessel. When he was finished, I asked him if he was done. He told me to get out of his sight, and that's when I did it. I gave him a Glasgow kiss. For those unfamiliar, it's a headbutt, and it's not the first headbutt I've delivered in my life. Having been brought up near Glasgow, he collapsed to the floor in shock, holding his nose, which didn't bleed unfortunately, looking up at me. I leaned down, and in my most Glaswegian accent, I whispered to him, If you ever disrespect me or my colleagues again, I'll kick the utter freak out of you next time, you runt. I went back in the room, 
while he did not. Inevitably, I got the HR call, Raj was in the room as well, and I could see that he had two black eyes as a result of the headbutt. I was asked to explain myself, and I told the truth, mostly. I explained about his abusive behavior, but focused specifically on the hand slamming and how it had been intimidating me. It hadn't really, but I massively played up on this aspect of the encounter. I described the headbutt as a reaction when he slammed the wall right next to my head with his hands. I wasn't sure what story he had told them, but I was sent away after this. I ultimately ended up with a disciplinary on my record, but no further consequences. Other team members were interviewed over the next few days, and once the pattern of abuse was established, Raj was terminated from the company. The most satisfying part of this was the day after, when everyone on the course went out for dinner. Natalie insisted that he stand next to her for the division group photograph, black eyes and all. I have to think that photograph contributed to his downfall in some way. This makes me think of a quote by masterful poet Matt Barnes. Violence is never the answer, but sometimes it is. I'm not saying what OP did was the right thing to do, but it did set off the chain reaction for what I think is a very appropriate ending for Raj. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. So of both of these stories that I've read today, which was your favorite and why? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you haven't yet, if you could like and subscribe, that would mean a lot to me. Whatever you do, whether it's liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, all of it helps grow this channel and I appreciate the heck out of it. So until next time, I'll see you all tomorrow with some more stories.